Section sixteen of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume two, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter six C, subsection C, Conscience, the beautiful soul, evil and the forgiveness of it, Part one. The antinomy in the moral view of the world that is that there is a moral consciousness and that there is none or that the validity the bindingness of duty has its ground beyond consciousness and conversely only takes effect in consciousness these contradictory elements had been combined in the idea in which the non-moral consciousness is to pass for moral its contingent knowledge and will to be accepted as fully sufficing and happiness to be its lot as a matter of grace moral self-consciousness took this self-contradictory idea not upon itself but transferred it to another being but this putting outside itself of what it must think as necessary is as much a contradiction in form as the other was in content but that which appears as contradictory and that in the division and again dissolution of which lies the round of activity peculiar to the moral attitude are inherently the same for pure duty qua pure knowledge is nothing else than the self of consciousness and the self of consciousness is existence and actuality and in the same way what is to be beyond actual consciousness is nothing else than pure thought is in fact the self because this is so self-consciousness for us or per se passes back into itself and becomes aware that that being is itself in which the actual is at once pure knowledge and pure duty it takes itself to be absolutely valid in its contingency to be that which knows its immediate particular existence as pure knowledge and action as the true objective reality and harmony this self of conscience the phase of spiritual life immediately certain of itself as absolute truth and objective being is the third type of spiritual self it is the outcome of the third sphere of the spiritual world and may be shortly contrasted with the two former types of self the totality or actuality which is revealed as the final result of the ethical world the world of the social order is the self of a person ethical personality its existence lies in its being recognized and acknowledged as the person is the self devoid of substance its existence is abstract reality too the person has a definite standing and that directly and unconditionally its self is the point in the sphere of its existence which is immediately at rest that point is not torn away from its universality the two the particular focus and its universality are therefore not in a relational process with regard to one another the universal is in it without distinction and is neither the content of the self nor is the self filled by itself the second self is the final truth and outcome of a world of culture is spirit that has recovered itself after and through disruption is absolute freedom in this self the former immediate unity of individual existence and universality finds its elements separated from one another the universal which remains at the same time a purely spiritual entity the state of recognition or universal will and universal knowledge the universal is object and content of the self and its universal actuality but the universal has not there the form of existence detached from the self in this mode of self it therefore gets no filling no positive content no world moral self-consciousness indeed lets its universal aspect get detached so that this aspect becomes a nature of its own and at the same time it retains this universality within itself in a superseded form but it is merely a game of dissembling it constantly interchanges these two characteristics in the form of conscience with its certainty of itself it first finds the content to fill the former emptiness of duty as well as the emptiness of right and the empty universal will and because this certainty of self is at the same time immediacy it finds in conscience definite existence having reached this level of its truth moral self-consciousness then leaves or rather supersedes this state of internal division and self-separation 
whence arose dissimulation the separation of its inherent being from the self of pure duty qua pure purpose from reality qua a nature and a sensibility opposed to mere purpose it is when thus returned into itself concrete moral spirit which does not make for itself a bare abstract standard out of the consciousness of pure duty a standard to be set up against actual conscious life on the contrary pure duty as also the sensuous nature opposed to pure duty are superseded moments this mode of spirit in its immediate unity is a moral being making itself actual and an act is immediately a concrete embodiment of morality given a case of action it is an objective reality for the knowing mind the latter qua conscience knows it in a direct concrete manner and at the same time it is merely as conscience knows it to be when knowledge is something other than its object it is contingent in character spirit however which is sure of itself is not at all an accidental knowledge of that kind is not a way of producing inside its own being ideas from which reality is divorced on the contrary since the separation between what is essential or inherent and self has been given up a case of moral action falls just as it is per se directly within immediate conscious certainty the sensible feeling form of knowledge and it merely is per se as it is in this form of knowledge action then qua realization is in this way the pure form of will the bare conversion of reality in the sense of a given case into a reality that is performed and done the conversion of the bare state of objective knowledge into one of knowledge about reality as something produced and brought about by consciousness just as sensuous certainty is directly taken up or rather converted into the essential life and substance of spirit this other transformation is also simple and unmediated a transition made through pure conception without changing the content the content being conditioned by some interest on the part of the consciousness knowing it further conscience does not break up the circumstances of the case into a variety of duties it does not operate as the positive general medium in which the manifold duties each for itself would keep their substantial existence undisturbed if it did so either no action could take place at all because of each concrete case in general containing opposition and in the specific case of morality opposition of duties and hence there would always be one side injured one duty violated when the act took definite shape or else if action did take place the violation of one of the conflicting duties would be the actual result brought about conscience is rather the negative single unity it is the absolute self which does away with this variety of substantial moral constituents it is simple action in accordance with duty action which does not fulfil this or that duty but knows and does what is concretely right it is therefore in general and for the first time in moral experience moral action as action and into this the previous stage of mere consciousness of morality without action has passed the concrete shape which the act takes may be analysed by a conscious process of distinction into a variety of properties that is in this case into a variety of moral relationships and these may either be each expressly held to be absolute as each must be if it is to be duty or again subjected to comparison and criticism in the simple moral action arising from conscience duties are shed so promiscuously that the isolated independence of all these separate entities is immediately destroyed and the process of critically considering and worrying about what our duty is finds no place at all in the unshaken certainty of conscience just as little again do we find in conscience that fluctuating uncertainty of mind which puts now so-called pure morality away from itself assigning it to some other holy being and takes itself to be unholy and then again on the other hand puts this moral purity within itself and places in that other the connection of the sensuous with the moral element it renounces all these semblances and dissemblances stellungen and verstellungen characteristic of the moral point of view when it gives up thinking that there is a contradiction between duty and actual reality 
according to this latter state of mind i act morally when i am conscious of performing merely pure duty and nothing else but that that is in fact when i do not act when however i really act i am conscious of an other of a reality which is there before me and one which i want to bring about i have a definite end and fulfil a definite duty there is something else therein than the pure duty which alone was supposed to be kept in view conscience on the other hand is the sense that when the moral consciousness declares pure duty to be the essence of its action this bare purpose is a dissemblance of the actual fact for the real fact is that bare duty consists in the empty abstraction of pure thought and finds its reality and content solely in some definite actual existence an actuality which is actuality of consciousness itself not of consciousness in the sense of a thought entity but as an individual conscience for its own part finds its truth to lie in the direct certainty regarding itself this immediate concrete certainty of itself is true reality looking at this certainty from the point of view of the opposition which consciousness involves its own immediate particularity constitutes the content of moral action and the form of moral action is just this very self as a pure process that is as the process of knowing in other words is private individual conviction looking more closely at the unity and the significance of the moments of this stage we find that moral consciousness conceived itself merely in the form of the inherent principle or as ultimate essence qua conscience however it lays hold of its explicit individual self-existence für sich sein or itself the contradiction involved in the moral point of view is resolved that is the distinction which lay at the basis of its peculiar attitude proves to be no distinction and melts into the process of pure negativity this process of negativity is however just the self a single simple self which is at once pure knowledge and knowledge of itself as this individual conscious life this self constitutes therefore the content of what formerly was the empty essence for it is something actual and concrete which no longer has the significance of being a nature alien to the ultimate essence a nature independent and with laws of its own as the negative element it introduces distinction into the pure essence a definite content and one too which has a value in its own right as it stands further this self is qua pure self-identical knowledge the universal without qualification so that just this knowledge being its very own knowledge being conviction constitutes duty duty is no longer the universal appearing over against and opposed to the self duty is known to have in this condition of separation and opposition no validity it is now the law which exists for the sake of the self and not the self for the sake of the law the law and duty however have for that reason not only the significance of existing on their own account but also of being inherent and essential for this knowledge is in virtue of its identity with itself just what is inherently essential this inherent being gets also separated in consciousness from that direct and immediate unity with self-existence so contrasted and opposed it is objective being it is being for something else duty itself now qua duty deserted by the self is known and thought to be merely a moment it has ceased to mean absolute being it has become degraded to something which is not a self does not exist on its own account and is thus what exists for something else but this existing for something else remains just for that reason an essential moment because self qua consciousness constitutes and establishes the opposition between existence for self and existence for another and now duty essentially means something immediately actual and is no longer a mere abstract consciousness of duty this existence for something else is then the inherently essential substance distinguished from the self conscience has not given up pure duty the abstract implicit essence pure duty is the essential moment of relating itself qua universality to others conscience is the common element of distinct self-consciousness and this is the substance in which the act secures subsistence and reality 
the moment enabling recognition by others to take place the moral self-consciousness does not possess this moment of recognition of pure consciousness which has definite existence and on that account really does not act at all does not effectually actualize anything its inherent nature is for it either the abstract unreal essence or else existence in the form of a reality which has no spiritual character the actual reality of conscience however is one which is itself that is an existence conscious of itself the spiritual element of being recognized doing something is therefore merely the translation of its particular content into that objective element where it is universal and is recognized and this very fact that the content is recognized makes the deed an actuality the action is recognized and thereby real because the actual reality is immediately bound up with conviction or knowledge or in other words knowledge of its purpose is immediately and at once the element of existence universal recognition for the essence of the act duty consists in the conviction conscience has about it this conviction is just the inherent principle itself it is inherently universal self-consciousness in other words is recognition and hence reality the result achieved under conviction of duty is therefore directly one which has substantial solid existence thus we hear nothing more there about good intention not coming to anything definite or about the good man faring badly what is known as duty is carried out completely and becomes an actual fact just because what is dutiful is the universal for all self-consciousnesses that which is recognized acknowledged and thus objectively is taken separately and alone however without the content of self this duty is existence for another the transparent element which has merely the significance of an unsubstantial ultimate factor in general if we look back on the sphere where in general spiritual reality made its appearance we find that the principle involved was that the utterance of individuality is the absolutely real the ultimately self-sufficing but the shape which in the first instance gave expression to this notion was the honest consciousness which was occupied and concerned with abstract fact itself this fact itself was there a predicate in conscience however it is for the first time a subject which has put all aspects of consciousness in it and for which all these moments substantiality in general external existence and essence of thought are contained in this certainty of itself the fact itself has substantiality in general in the ethical order Sittlichkeit, external existence in culture self-knowing essence of thought in morality and in conscience it is the subject which knows these moments within itself while the honest consciousness is forever grasping merely the bare and empty fact itself conscience on the other hand secures the fact itself in its fullness a fullness which conscience of itself supplies conscience has this power through its knowing the moments of consciousness as moments and controlling them because it is their negative essential principle when conscience is considered in relation to the particular features of the opposition which appears in action and when we consider its consciousness regarding the nature of those features its attitude towards the reality of the particular case where action takes effect is in the first instance that of knowledge so far as the aspect of universality is present in such knowledge it is the business of conscientious action qua knowledge to compass the reality before it in an unrestricted exhaustive manner and thus get to know exactly the circumstances of the case and give them due consideration this knowledge however since it is aware of universality as a moment is in consequence a kind of knowledge of these circumstances which is conscious all the while of not embracing them is conscious of not being conscientious in its procedure the genuinely universal and pure relation of knowledge would be one towards something not opposed a relation to itself but action through the opposition essentially implied in action is related to what negates consciousness to a reality existing per se contrasted with the simple nature of pure consciousness the absolute other externality multiplicity per se is a sheer plurality of circumstances which breaks up indefinitely and spreads in all directions 
backwards in their conditions sidewards in their associations forwards in their consequences the conscientious mind is aware of this state of affairs and of its relation thereto and knows it is not acquainted to the full and complete extent required with the case in which its action takes effect and knows that its pretence of conscientiously weighing and considering all the circumstances is futile this acquaintance with and consideration of all the circumstances however are not entirely absent but they are merely present as a moment as something which is only for others and the conscientious mind holds its incomplete knowledge to be sufficient and complete merely because it is its own knowledge in a similar way is constituted the process in connection with the universality of the essential principle the universality by which the content is characterized when determined through pure consciousness conscience when it goes on to act takes up a relation to the various sides of the case the case breaks up into separate elements and the relation of pure consciousness towards it does the same whereby the multiplicity characteristic of the case becomes a multiplicity of duties conscience knows that it has to select and decide amongst them for none of them specifically in its content is an absolute duty only duty pure and simple is so but this abstract entity has in its realization come to denote self-conscious ego spirit certain of itself is at rest within itself in the form of conscience and its real universality its duty lies in its bare conviction concerning duty this bare conviction as such is as empty as pure duty pure in the sense that nothing within it no definite content is duty action however has to take place the individual must determine to do something or other and spirit which is certain of itself in which the inherent principle has attained the significance of self-conscious ego knows it has this determination this specific content within the immediate certainty of its own self this certainty being a determination and a content is natural consciousness that is the various impulses and inclinations conscience admits no content as absolute for it because it is absolute negativity of all that is definite it determines from itself alone the circle of the self however within which determinateness as such falls is so-called sensibility in order to get a content out of the immediate certainty of self there is no means to be found except sensibility everything that in previous modes of experience was presented as good or bad law and right is something other than immediate certainty of self it is a universal which is now a relative entity an existence for another or looked at otherwise it is an object which while connecting and relating consciousness with itself comes between consciousness and its own proper truth and instead of that object being the immediacy of consciousness it rather cuts consciousness off from itself for conscience however certainty of self is the pure direct and immediate truth and this truth is thus its immediate certainty of self presented as content that is its truth is altogether the caprice of the individual and the accidental content of his unconscious natural existence his sensibility this content at the same time passes for essential moral reality for duty for pure duty as was found when testing and examining laws is utterly indifferent to every content and gets along with any here it has at the same time the essential form of self-existence of existing on its own account and this form of individual conviction is nothing else than the sense of the emptiness of pure duty and the consciousness that this is merely a moment that its substantial independence is a predicate which finds its subjects in the individual whose caprice gives pure duty content can connect every content with this form and attach its feeling of conscientiousness to any content an individual increases his property in a certain way it is a duty that each should see to the maintenance of himself and family and no less ensure the possibility of his being serviceable to his neighbours and of doing good to those standing in need the individual is aware that this is a duty for this content is directly contained in the certainty he has of himself he perceives further that he fulfils this particular duty in this particular case 
other people possibly consider the specific way he adopts as fraud they hold by other sides of the concrete case presented while he holds firmly to this particular side of it by the fact of his being conscious that the increase of property is a pure and absolute duty in the same way there is fulfilled by the individual as a duty what other people call violence and wrongdoing the duty of asserting one's independence against others and again the duty of preserving one's life and maintaining the possibility of being useful to one's neighbours others call this cowardice but what they call courage really violates both these duty but what they call courage really violates both these duties but cowardice cannot be so stupid and thoughtless as not to know that the maintenance of life and the possibility of being useful to others are duties so inept as not to be convinced of the dutifulness of its action and not to know that dutifulness consists in knowledge otherwise it would commit the absurdity of being without morality since morality lies in the consciousness of having fulfilled one's duty this will not be lacking when the action is what is called cowardice any more than when it is what is called courage as the abstraction called duty is capable of every content it is quite equal to this latter content the agent acting knows what he does to be duty and since he knows this and conviction as to duty is just dutifulness he is thus recognized and acknowledged by others the act thereby becomes accepted as valid and has actual existence it is of no avail to object to this freedom which puts one kind of content as well as any other into this universal inert receptacle of pure duty and pure knowledge by asserting that another content ought to have been put there for whatever the content be each content has upon it the stain of determinateness from which pure knowledge is free which pure knowledge can disregard just as readily as it can take up every determinateness in turn every content through its being determinate stands on the same footing with every other even though it seems to have precisely the character that the particularity in the content is cancelled it may well seem since in concrete cases duty breaks regularly into opposition and by doing so sunders the opposite's particularity and universality that the duty whose content is the universal as such contains on that account ipso facto the nature of pure duty and that thus form and content are here entirely in accord on this view it might seem that for example acting for the universal good for what is the best for all is to be preferred to acting for what is the best for the individual but this universal duty is in its entirety what is present as self-contained actual substance in the form of established law and right and holds good independently of the individual's knowledge and conviction and immediate interest it is thus precisely that against the form of which morality as a whole is directed as regards its content however even this is determinate in character in so far as the universally best is opposed to the individual best consequently its law is one from which conscience knows itself to be absolutely free and it gives itself the absolute privilege to add and pair to neglect as well as fulfil it then again the above distinction of duty towards the individual and duty towards the universal is not something fixed and final when we look at the nature of the opposition in question on the contrary what the individual does for himself is to the advantage of the universal as well the more he looks after his own good not only is there a greater possibility of his usefulness to others his very reality consists merely in his living and existing in connection with others his individual enjoyment means ultimately and essentially putting what is his own at the disposal of others and helping them to secure their enjoyment in fulfilling duty to individuals and hence duty to self duty to the general thus also gets fulfilled weighing considering comparing duties should disappear here would take the line of calculating the advantage which the general would get from any given action but there can be no such process partly because morality would thereby be handed over to the inevitable contingency characteristic of mere insight 
partly because it is precisely the nature of conscience to have done with all this calculating and weighing of duties and to decide directly from itself without reasons of any kind in this way then conscience acts and maintains itself in the unity of its essential being and its objective existence for itself in the unity of pure thought and individuality it is spirit certain of itself which inherently possesses its own truth within itself in its knowledge a knowledge in the sense of knowledge of its duty it maintains its being therein by the fact that the positive element in the act the content as well as form of duty and the knowledge of duty belong to the self to the certainty of itself what however seeks to come before the self with an inherent being of its own is held to be not truly real merely a transcendent element only a moment consequently it is not universal knowledge in general that has a value but what is known of the circumstances it puts into duty which is the universal immanent essence the content which it derives from its natural individuality for the content is one that is present in its own being this content in virtue of the universal medium wherein it exists becomes the duty which it carries out and empty bare duty is through this very fact affirmed to be something transcended a moment this content is its emptiness transcended and cancelled that is is the fulfilling of pure duty but at the same time conscience is detached from every possible content it absolves itself from every specific duty which would try to pass for a law in the strength of its certainty of itself it has the majesty of absolute self-sufficiency of absolute autarchia to bind or to lose this self-determination is at once therefore absolute conformity to duty duty is the knowledge itself this pure and simple selfhood however is the immanent principle and essence for this inherent principle is pure self-identity and self-identity lies in this consciousness this pure knowledge is immediately objective is existence for another for qua pure self-identity it is immediacy it is objective being this being however is at the same time pure universality the selfhood of all in other words action is acknowledged and hence actual this being forms the element by which conscience directly stands on a footing of equality with every self-consciousness and this relation means not an abstract impersonal law but the self of conscience in that this right which conscience does is at the same time however a fact for others a disparity seems to affect conscience the duty which it fulfils is a determinate content that content is no doubt the self of consciousness and so its knowledge of itself its identity with itself but when fulfilled when planted in the general element of existence this identity is no longer knowledge no longer this process of distinction which directly and at the same time does away with its distinctions rather in the sphere of existence distinction is set up as subsistent and the act is a determinate specific one not identical with the element of everybody's self-consciousness and hence not necessarily acknowledged and recognized both aspects conscience qua acting and the general consciousness acknowledging this act to be duty stand equally loose from the specific character belonging to this deed on account of this freedom and detachment the relation of the two within the common medium of their connection is rather a relationship of complete disparity as a result of which the consciousness doing and owning the act finds itself in complete uncertainty regarding the spirit which does the act and is certain of itself this spirit acts and places in existence a particular determinate characteristic others hold to this existence as its truth and are therein certain of this spirit it has therein expressed what it takes to be its duty but it is detached and free from any specific duty it has therefore left the point where other people think it actually to be and this very medium of existence and duty as inherently existing are held by it to be merely transitory moments what it does places before them it also displaces again or rather has eo ipso immediately displaced for its reality is for it 
not the duty and determinate content thus put forward but rather is the reality which it has in its absolute certainty of itself the other self-consciousnesses do not know then whether this particular conscience is morally good or is wicked or rather not merely can they not know this conscience but they must take it to be also wicked for just as it stands loose to the determinate content of duty and detached from duty as inherently existing so they do likewise what is placed before them they themselves know how to displace or dissemble it is something expressing merely the self of another individual not their own they do not merely know themselves to be detached and free from it but have to resolve and dissipate it within their own consciousness reduce it to nothingness by judgments and explanations in order to preserve their own self but the act of conscience is not merely this determination of existence a determinate content forsaken by the pure self what ought to be binding as duty and get recognized as such only is so through knowledge and conviction as to its being duty by knowledge of self in the deed done when the deed ceases to have in it this element of self it ceases to be what is alone its essential nature its existence if deserted by this consciousness of self would be an ordinary reality and the act would appear to us a way of fulfilling one's pleasure and desire what ought to exist has here essentiality only by its being known to be individuality giving itself expression and its being thus known is the fact acknowledged and recognized by others and is that which as such ought to have existence the self enters existence as self the spirit which is certain of itself exists as such for others its immediate act is not what is accepted and real what is acknowledged by others is not the determinate element not the inherent being but solely and simply the self knowing itself as such the element which gives permanence and stability is universal self-consciousness what enters this element cannot be the effect of the act the latter does not last there and maintains no permanence only self-consciousness is what is recognized and gains concrete reality here again then we see language to be the form in which spirit finds existence language is the way self-consciousness exists for others it is self-consciousness which is there immediately present as such and in the form of this actual universal self-consciousness language is self separating itself from itself which comes objectively before itself as the pure ego identical with ego which at once maintains itself in this objective form as this actual self and at the same time fuses directly with others and is their self-consciousness the self perceives itself at the same time that it is perceived by others and this perceiving is just existence which has become a self the content which language has here obtained is no longer the self we found in the world of culture perverted perverting and distraught it is spirit which having returned to itself is certain of itself certain in itself of its truth of its own act of recognition and of being recognized as this knowledge the language of the ethical spirit of society is law and simple command and complaint which is but a tear shed over necessity moral consciousness on the other hand remains dumb shut up within its inner life for self has no existence as yet in its case rather existence and self there stand in the first instance in external relation to each other language however comes forward merely as the mediating element between independent self-consciousnesses recognized and acknowledged and the existent self means immediately universal recognition means recognition in manifold ways and in this very manifoldness simple recognition what the language of conscience contains is the self knowing itself as essential reality this alone is what that language expresses and this expression is the true realization of doing anything and renders the act valid and acceptable consciousness expresses its conviction in this conviction alone is the action duty it holds good as duty too solely by the conviction being expressed for universal self-consciousness stands detached from the specific act which merely exists 
the act qua existence means nothing to it what it holds of importance is the conviction that the act is a duty and this appears concretely in language to realize the act means here not translating its content from the form of purpose or subjectivity into the form of abstract reality it means translating it from the form of immediate certainty of self which takes its knowledge its self-existence to be the essential fact into the form of the assurance that consciousness is convinced of its duty and being conscious knows of itself what duty is this assurance thus guarantees that it is convinced of its conviction being the essential fact whether the assurance that it acts from conviction of duty is true whether that really is duty which is done these questions or doubts have no meaning if directed against conscience in the case of the question whether the assurance is true it would be assumed that the inner intention is different from the one put forward that is that the willing of a particular self can be separated from duty from the will of the universal and pure consciousness the latter will would in that case be a matter of words while the former would be strictly the real moving principle of the act but such a distinction between the universal consciousness and the particular self is precisely what has been cancelled and the superseding of it constitutes conscience immediate knowledge on the part of self which is certain of itself is law and duty its intention by being its own intention is what is right all that is required is that it should know this and state its conviction that its knowledge and will are the right the expression of this assurance ipso facto cancels the form of its particularity it recognizes thereby the necessary universality of the self in that it calls itself conscience it calls itself pure self-knowledge and pure abstract will that is it calls itself a universal knowledge and will which acknowledges and recognizes others is like them for they are just this pure self-knowledge and will and which is on that account also recognized by them in the willing of the self which is certain of itself in this knowledge of the self as the essential reality lies the essence of the right when any one says therefore he is acting from conscience he is saying what is true for his conscience is the self which knows and wills he must however necessarily say so for this self has to be at the same time universal self it is not universal in the content of the act for this content is per se indifferent on account of its being specific and determinate the universality lies in the form of the act it is this form which is to be affirmed as real the form is the self which as such is actual in language pronounces itself to be the truth and just by so doing acknowledges all other selves and is recognized by them end of section sixteen section seventeen of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter six c subsection c conscience the beautiful soul evil and the forgiveness of it part two conscience then in its majestic sublimity above any specific law and every content of duty puts whatever content there is into its knowledge and willing it becomes moral genius and originality which takes the inner voice of its immediate knowledge to be a voice divine and since in such knowledge it directly knows existence as well it is divine creative power which contains living force in its very conception it is in itself too divine worship service of god for its action consists in beholding this its own proper divinity this solitary worship this service of god in solitude of soul is at the same time essentially service of god in public on the part of a religious community and pure inward self-knowledge and perception of self pass to being a moment of consciousness to behold itself is to exist objectively and this objective element is the utterance of its knowledge and will in a universal way through such expression the self becomes established and accepted 
and the act becomes an effective deed a deed carrying out a definite result what gives reality and subsistence to its deed is universal self-consciousness when however conscience finds expression this puts the certainty of itself in the form of pure self and thereby as universal self others let the act hold as valid owing to the explicit terms in which the self is thus expressed and acknowledged to be the essential reality the spirit and the substance of their community are thus the mutual assurance of their conscientiousness of their good intentions the rejoicing over this reciprocal purity of purpose the quickening and refreshment received from the glorious privilege of knowing and of getting expression of fostering and cherishing a state so altogether excellent and desirable so far as this sphere of conscience still distinguishes its abstract consciousness from its self-consciousness its life is merely hid in god god is indeed immediately present to its mind and heart to its self but what is revealed its actual consciousness and the mediating process of this consciousness is to it something other than that hidden inner life and the immediacy of god's presence but with the completion of conscience the distinction between its abstract consciousness and its self-consciousness is done away it knows that the abstract consciousness is just this self this individual self-existence which is certain of itself that the very difference between the terms is abolished in the immediateness of the relation of the self to the ultimate being which when placed outside the self is the abstract essence and the being concealed from it for a relation is mediate when the terms related are not one and the same but each is a different term for the other and is one only with the other in some third term an immediate relation however means in fact nothing else than the unity of the terms having risen above the meaningless position of holding these distinctions which are not distinctions at all to be still such consciousness knows the immediateness of the presence of ultimate being within it to be the unity of that being and its self it thus knows itself to be the living inherent reality and takes its knowledge to be religion which qua knowledge viewed as an object or knowledge with an objective existence is the utterance of the religious communion regarding its own spirit we see then here self-consciousness withdrawn into the inmost retreats of its being with all externality as such gone and vanished from it returned into the intuition of ego as altogether identical with ego an intuition where this ego is all that is essential and all that exists it is absorbed in this conception of itself for it is driven to the extreme limit of its extreme positions and in such a way that the moments distinguished moments through which it is real or still consciousness are not merely for us these bare extremes rather what it is for itself and what to it is inherent and what is for it existence all these moments evaporate into abstractions they have no longer stability no substantial existence for this phase of consciousness everything that was hitherto for consciousness essential has reverted into these abstractions when clarified to this degree of transparency consciousness exists in its poorest form and the poverty constituting its sole and only possession is itself a process of disappearance this absolute certainty into which the substance has been resolved is absolute untruth which collapses within itself it is absolute self-consciousness in which consciousness with its relation of self and object is submerged and goes under looking at this absorption and disappearance from within the inherent and essential substance is for consciousness knowledge in the sense of its knowledge being consciousness it is split up into the opposition between itself and the object which is for it the essentially real but this very object is what is perfectly transparent is itself and its consciousness is merely knowledge concerning itself all life and all spiritual truth have returned into this self and have lost their difference from the ego the moments of consciousness are therefore these extreme abstractions of which none holds its ground but each loses itself in the other and produces it we have here the process of the unhappy soul in restless change with self in the present case however 
this is a conscious experience going on inside itself fully conscious of being the notion of reason while the unhappy soul above spoken of was only reason implicitly the absolute certainty of self thus finds itself qua consciousness converted directly into a dying sound a mere objectification of its subjectivity or self-existence but this world so created is the utterance of its own voice which in like manner it has directly heard and the echo of which only returns to it this return does not therefore mean that the self is there in its true reality an und für sich for the real is for it not an inherent being is not per se but its very self just as little has consciousness itself existence for the objective aspect does not succeed in becoming something negative of the actual self in the same way as this self does not reach complete actuality it lacks force to externalize itself the power to make itself a thing and endure existence it lives in dread of staining the radiance of its inner being by action and existence and to preserve the purity of its heart it flees from contact with actuality and steadfastly perseveres in a state of self-willed impotence to renounce a self which is pared away to the last point of abstraction and to give itself substantial existence or in other words to transform its thought into being and commit itself to absolute distinction that between thought and being the hollow object which it produces now fills it therefore with the feeling of emptiness its activity consists in yearning it merely loses itself in becoming an unsubstantial shadowy object and rising above this loss and falling back on itself finds itself merely as lost in this transparent purity of its moments it becomes a sorrow-laden beautiful soul as it is called its light dims and dies within it and it vanishes as a shapeless vapour dissolving into thin air this silent fusion of the pithless unsubstantial elements of evaporated life has however still to be taken in the other sense of the reality of conscience and in the way its process actually appears conscience has to be considered as acting the objective moment in this phase of consciousness took above the determinate form of universal consciousness the knowing of self is qua this particular self different from another self language in which all reciprocally recognize and acknowledge each other as acting conscientiously this general equality breaks up into the inequality of each individual existing for himself each consciousness turns from its universality back into itself each is just as much reflected absolutely into itself as it is universal by this means there necessarily comes about the opposition of individuality to other individuals and to the universal and this relation and its procedure we have to consider or again this universality and duty have the absolutely opposite significance they signify determinate individuality exempting itself from what is universal individuality which looks on pure duty as universality that has appeared merely on the surface and is turned on its outside duty is merely a matter of words and passes for that whose being is for something else conscience which in the first instance takes up merely a negative attitude towards duty qua a given determinate duty feels itself detached from it but since conscience fills empty duty with the determinate content drawn from its own self it is positively aware of the fact that it qua this particular self makes its own content its pure self as it is empty knowledge is without content and without definiteness the content which it supplies to that knowledge is drawn from its own self qua this determinate self is drawn from itself as a natural individuality in speaking of the conscientiousness of its action it is doubtless aware of its pure self but in the purpose of its action a purpose which brings in a concrete content it is conscious of itself as this particular individual and is conscious of the opposition between what it is for itself and what it is for others of the opposition of universality or duty and its state of being reflected into self away from the universal while in this way the opposition into which conscience passes when it acts finds expression in its inner life the opposition is at the same time disparity on its outer side in the sphere of existence 
the disparity or discordance of its particular individuality with reference to another individual its special peculiarity consists in the fact that the two elements constituting its consciousness that is the self and the inherent nature an sich, are unequal in value and significance within it in being accepted as valid they are so determined that certainty of self is the essential fact as against the inherent nature or the universal which is taken to be merely a moment over against this internal determination there thus stands the element of existence the universal consciousness and for this latter it is rather universality duty which is the essential fact while well, individuality which exists for itself and is opposed to the universal has merely the value of a superseded moment the first consciousness is held to be evil by the consciousness which thus stands by the fact of duty because of the lack of congruity or identity of its internal subjective life with the universal and since at the same time the first consciousness declares its act to be identity with itself to be duty and conscientiousness it is held by that universal consciousness to be hypocrisy the course taken by this opposition is in the first instance the formal reinstatement of its identity between what the evil consciousness is in its own nature and what it declares itself to be it has to be made manifest that it is evil and its objective existence thus made congruent with its real nature the hypocrisy must be unmasked this return of the disparity present in hypocrisy into the state of congruency or identity is not at once brought to pass by the mere fact that as people usually say hypocrisy just proves its reverence for duty and virtue through assuming the appearance of them and using this as a mask to hide itself from its own consciousness no less than from another as if in this acknowledgment and recognition in itself of its opposite eo ipso congruency and agreement were implied and contained yet even then it is just as truly done with this recognition in words and is reflected into self and in the very fact of its using the inherent and essential reality merely as something which has a significance for another consciousness there is really implied its own contempt for that inherent principle and the demonstration of the worthlessness of that reality for all for what lets itself be used as an external instrument shows itself to be a thing which has within it no proper weight and worth of its own moreover this congruency or identity is not brought about either by the evil consciousness persisting one-sidedly in its own state or by the judgment of the universal consciousness if the former disclaims the consciousness of duty and maintains that what the latter pronounces to be baseness to be absolute discordance with universality is an action according to inner law and conscience then in this one-sided assurance of identity and concord there still remains its want of agreement with the other since this other universal consciousness certainly does not believe the assurance and does not acknowledge it in other words since one-sided insistence on one extreme destroys itself evil would indeed thereby confess to being evil but in so doing would at once cancel itself and cease to be hypocrisy and so would not qua hypocrisy be unmasked it confesses itself in fact to be evil by asserting that while opposing what is recognized as universal it is acting according to inner law and conscience for were this law and conscience not the law of its particularity and caprice it would not be something inward something private but what is universally accepted and acknowledged when therefore any one says he acts towards others from a law and conscience of his own he is saying in point of fact that he is abusing and wronging them but actual conscience is not this insistence on our knowledge and the will which are opposed to what is universal the universal is the element of its existence and its very language pronounces its action to be recognized duty just as little when the universal consciousness emphasizes and persists in its own judgment does this unmask and dissipate hypocrisy when that universal consciousness stigmatizes hypocrisy as bad base and so on it appeals in passing such a judgment to its own law just as the evil consciousness on its side does too 
for the former law makes its appearance in opposition to the latter and thereby is a particular law it has therefore no antecedent claim over the other law rather it legitimizes this other law hence the universal consciousness by thus emulating the other does precisely the opposite of what it means to do for it shows that its so-called true duty which ought to be universally acknowledged is something not acknowledged and recognized and consequently it grants the other an equal right of independently existing on its own account this judgment of universal consciousness however has at the same time another side to it from which it leads the way to the dissolution of the opposition in question consciousness of the universal does not proceed qua real and qua acting to deal with the evil consciousness for this latter rather is the real in opposing the latter it is a consciousness which is not entangled in the opposition of particular and universal involved in action it stays within the universality of thought takes up the attitude of an apprehending intelligence and its first act is merely that of judgment through this judgment it now places itself as was just observed alongside the first consciousness and the latter through this identity this likeness between them comes to see itself in this other consciousness for in the attitude of apprehension consciousness of duty is passive thereby it is in contradiction with itself as the absolute will of duty as the self that determines absolutely from itself it may well preserve itself in its purity for it does not act it is hypocrisy which wants to see the fact of judging taken for the actual deed and instead of proving its uprightness and honesty by acts does so by expressing fine sentiments it is thus constituted entirely in the same way as that against which the reproach is made of putting its phrases in place of duty in both cases alike the aspect of reality is distinct from the expressed statements in the one case owing to the selfish purpose of the action in the other through failure to act at all a result which is inevitable when there is mere talk about duty for duty without deeds is altogether meaningless the act of judging however has also to be looked at as a positive act of thought and has a positive content this aspect makes the contradiction present in the apprehending consciousness and this identity with the first consciousness still more complete the active consciousness declares its specific deed to be its duty and the consciousness that passes judgment cannot deny this for duty as such is form void of all content and capable of any in other words concrete action inherently implying diversity in its many-sidedness involves the universal aspect which is that which is taken as duty just as much as the particular which constitutes the share and interest the individual has in the act the consciousness expressing its judgment does not now stop at the former aspect of duty and rest content with the knowledge which the active agent has of this that is that this is its duty the condition and the status of its reality it holds on to the other aspect diverts the act into the inner realm and explains the act from selfish motives and from its inner intention an intention different from the act itself as every act is capable of treatment in respect of its dutifulness so too each can be considered from this other point of view of particularity for as an act it is the actuality of an individual this process of judging then takes the act out of the sphere of its objective existence and turns it back into that of the inner realm into the form of specific and individual particularity if the act carries glory with it then the inner aspect is judged as love of fame if it altogether fits in with the position and status of the individual without going beyond this position and is so constituted that the individuality in question does not have the position hanging on to it as an external appendage but through itself supplies the content to this universality and by that very process shows itself to be capable of a higher status then the inner nature of the act is judged as ambition and so on since in the act in general the individual who acts comes to see himself in objective form or gets the feeling of his own being in his objective existence and thus attains enjoyment 
the judgment on the act finds the inner nature of it to be an impulse towards personal and private happiness even though this happiness were to consist merely in inner moral vanity the enjoyment of a sense of personal excellence and in the foretaste and hope of a happiness to come no act can escape being judged in such a way for duty for duty's sake this bare purpose is something unreal what reality it has lies in the deed of some individuality and the action thereby has in it the aspect of particularity no hero is a hero to his valet not however because the hero is not a hero but because the valet is the valet with whom the hero has to do not as a hero but as a man who eats drinks and dresses who in short appears as a particular individual with certain personal wants and idiosyncrasies in the same way there is no act in which that process of judgment cannot oppose the particular aspect of the individuality to the universal aspect of the act and set the valet of morality against the hero who does the act the consciousness that so passes judgment is in consequence itself base and mean because it divides the act up and brings out and holds on to its innermost inconsistency and self-discordance it is furthermore hypocrisy because it gives out this way of judging not as another fashion of being wicked but as the correct consciousness of the act sets itself up in its unreality in this vanity of knowing well and better far above the deed it decries and wants to find its mere words without deeds taken for an admirable kind of reality on this account then putting itself on a level with the agent on whom it passes judgment it is recognized by the latter as the same as himself this latter does not merely find himself apprehended as something alien or external to and unlike or discordant with that other but rather finds the other in its peculiar constitutive character identical with himself seeing this similarity and giving this expression he openly declares himself to the other and expects in like manner that the other having in point of fact put itself on the same level will respond in the same terms on its side will give voice to the likeness found within it and that thus the state of mutual recognition will be brought about his confession is not an attitude of abasement or humiliation before the other is not flinging himself away for to give the matter expression in this way has not the one-sided character which would fix and establish his disparity with the other on the contrary it is solely because of seeing the likeness of the other to him that he gives himself utterance in making his confession he announces from his side their common likeness and does so for the reason that language is the existence of spirit as an immediate self he thus expects that the other will make its own contribution to this manner of existence but the admission on the part of the one who is wicked i am so is not followed by a reply making a similar confession this was not what that way of judging meant at all far from it it repels this community of nature and is the hard-heartedness which keeps to itself and rejects all continuity with the other by so doing the scene is changed the one who made the confession sees himself thrust off and takes the other to be in the wrong when he refuses to let his own inner nature go forth in the objective shape of an express utterance opposes and contrasts the beauty of his own soul with the wicked individual and opposes to the confession of the penitent the stiff-necked attitude of the self-consistent equable character and the rigid silence of one who keeps himself to himself and refuses to throw himself away for someone else here we find asserted the highest pitch of revolt to which a spirit certain of itself can reach for it beholds itself qua this bare self-knowledge in another conscious being and in such a way that the external form of this other is not an unessential thing as in the case of an object of wealth but thought knowledge itself is what is opposed to it it is this absolutely unbroken continuity of pure knowledge which refuses to establish communication with an other which had ipso facto by making its confession renounced separate isolated self-existence had affirmed its particularity to be cancelled 
and thereby established itself as continuous with the other that is established itself as universal the other however retains in its own case and reserves to itself its uncommunicative isolated independence in the case of the individual making the confession it retains just the very thing which that individual has already cast away it thereby proves itself to be a form of consciousness which has forsaken and denies the very nature of spirit for it does not understand that spirit in the absolute certainty of itself is master and lord over every deed and over all reality and can reject and cast them off and make them as if they had never been at the same time it does not see the contradiction it is committing in not allowing a rejection which has been made in express language to pass for genuine rejection while itself has the certainty of its own spiritual life not in a concrete real act but in its inner nature and finds the objective existence of this inner being in the mere utterance of its own judgment it is thus its own self which checks that others return from the act to the spiritual objectivity of spoken utterance and to spiritual identity and agreement and by its stiffness produces the discordance and dissimilarity which still remain now so far as the spirit which is certain of itself in the form of a beautiful soul does not possess the faculty of relinquishing the self-absorbed uncommunicative knowledge of itself it cannot attain to any identity with the consciousness that is repulsed and so cannot succeed in seeing the unity of itself in another life cannot reach objective existence the equality comes about therefore merely in a negative way as a state of being devoid of spiritual character the beautiful soul then has no concrete reality it subsists in the contradiction between its pure self and the necessity felt by this self to externalize itself and turn into something actual it exists in the immediacy of this rooted and fixed opposition an immediacy which alone is the middle term mediating and reconciling an opposition which has arisen to its pure abstraction and is pure being or empty nothingness thus the beautiful soul being conscious of this contradiction in its unreconciled immediacy is unhinged disordered and runs to madness passes away in yearning and is consumed in pining inanition thereby it gives up as a fact its stubborn insistence on its own isolated self-existence but only to bring forth the soulless spiritless unity of abstract being the true that is to say the self-conscious and actual balance or adjustment of the two sides is necessitated by and already contained in the foregoing breaking the hard heart and raising it to the level of universality is the same process which appeared in the case of the consciousness that expressly made its confession the wounds of that spirit heal and leave no scars behind the deed is not something imperishable the spirit takes it back into itself and the aspect of particularity present in it whether in the form of an intention or of an existential negativity and limitation immediately passes away the process of actually realizing self the form of its act is merely a moment of the whole and the same is true of the knowledge functioning through judgment and establishing and maintaining the distinction between the particular and universal aspects of action the evil consciousness spoken of definitely yields up and relinquishes itself or sets itself down as a moment being drawn into the way of express confession by seeing itself in another this other however must have its one-sided unaccepted and unacknowledged judgment broken down just as the former has to abandon its one-sided unacknowledged existence in the state of particularity and isolation and as the former displays the power of spirit over its reality so this other must manifest the power of spirit over its constitutive and determinate notion the latter however renounces thought that divides and separates and the rigid imperviousness of uncommunicative self-existence for the reason that in point of fact it sees itself in the first 
that which in this way abandons its reality and makes itself into a superseded particular this diesen shows itself thereby to be in fact universal it turns away from its external reality back into itself as inner essence and there the universal consciousness thus knows and finds itself the forgiveness it extends to the first is the renunciation of self of its unreal being since it identifies this unreal nature and what other element of real action and recognizes what was called bad a determination assigned to action by thought to be good or rather it lets go and gives up this distinction of determinate thought with its self-determining isolated judgment just as the other foregoes determining the act in isolation and for its own private behoof the word of reconciliation is the objectively existent spirit which sees and immediately apprehends the pure knowledge of itself qua universal being in its opposite in the pure knowledge of itself qua absolutely self-confined single individual a reciprocal recognition which is absolute spirit absolute spirit enters existence merely at the culminating point at which its pure knowledge about itself is the opposition and interchange with itself knowing that its pure knowledge is the abstract essential reality absolute spirit is this knowing duty in absolute opposition to the knowledge which knows itself qua absolute singleness of self to be the essentially real the former is the pure continuity of the universal which knows the individuality that thinks itself the real to be inherently null and not to be evil the latter again is absolute discreteness which thinks itself absolute in its pure oneness and thinks the universal is the unreal which exists only for others both aspects are refined and clarified to this degree of purity where there is no selfless existence left no negative of consciousness in either of them where instead the one element of duty is the self-identical character of its self-knowledge and the other element of evil equally has its purpose in its own inner being and its reality in its own mode of utterance the content of this utterance is the substance that gives it subsistence the utterance is the assurance and asseveration of the certainty of spirit within its own self these spirits both certain of themselves have each no other purpose than its own pure self and no other reality and existence than just this pure self but they are still different and the difference is absolute because holding within this element of the pure notion the difference is absolute too not merely for us tracing the experience but for the notions themselves which stand in this opposition for while these notions are indeed determinate and specific relatively to one another they are at the same time in themselves universal so that they compass the whole range of the self and this self can have no other content than this its own determinate constitution which neither transcends the self nor is more restricted than it for the one aspect the absolutely universal is pure self-knowledge as well as the other the absolute discreteness of single individuality and both are merely this pure self-knowledge both determinate aspects then are cognitive pure notions which know qua notions whose very constitution consists in immediately knowing or in other words whose relationship and opposition is the ego because of this they are for one another these absolutely opposed elements it is what is completely inner that has in this way come into opposition to itself and entered objective existence they constitute pure knowledge which owing to this opposition takes the form of consciousness but as yet it is not self-consciousness it obtains this actualization in the course of the process through which this opposition passes for this opposition is really itself the indiscreet continuity and identity of ego equals ego and each by itself inherently cancels itself just through the contradiction in its pure universality which while implying continuity and identity at the same time still resists its identity with the other and separates itself from it through this relinquishment of separate selfhood the knowledge which in its existence is in a state of diremption 
returns into the unity of the self it is the concrete actual ego universal knowledge of self in its absolute opposite in the knowledge which is internal to and within the self and which because of the very purity of its separate subjective existence is itself completely universal the reconciling affirmation the yes with which both egos desist from their existence in opposition is the existence of the ego expanded into a duality an ego which remains therein one and identical with itself and possesses the certainty of itself in its complete relinquishment and its opposite it is god appearing in the midst of those who know themselves in the form of pure knowledge End of section seventeen. Section eighteen of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume two, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter seven, Religion. Translator's note the appearance of absolute spirit as a principle constituting on its own account a distinctive stage of experience is at once a demand of the preceding development and a condition of making experience self-complete finite or socialized spiritual existence is at its best incapable of establishing the truth that spirit is the only reality for the more finite spirit approximates to the state of claiming to be self-contained the more it is dependent on universal self-consciousness a trans-finite or absolute spiritual being as such is thus necessary to realize and sustain the fullness of meaning which finite spirit possesses moreover if the truth is the whole and only so is truth self-complete and self-explaining and if reality is essentially spiritual then experience only finds its complete meaning realized in the principle of absolute spirit hence the final stage of the phenomenology of experience is the appearance therein of absolute spirit moreover absolute spirit in its own distinctive existence could only appear at the end of the process of experience for the whole of that process is required to reveal and to constitute the substance of which the absolute consists but the peculiarity of the stage now reached is that here the absolute operates in its undivided totality to form a definite type of experience or in the language of the text we have the absolute here conscious of its self no doubt in all the previous stages consciousness self-consciousness reason spirit the absolute has been implied as a limiting principle at once substantiating and determining the boundaries of each stage hence each stage had an absolute of its own the character of which was derived in each case from the peculiarity of the stage in question now however we have the absolute by itself in its single self-completeness as the sole formative factor of a certain type of experience the absolute then in its own self-complete reality appears as the constitutive principle of experience the experience here is the self-consciousness of absolute spirit it appears to itself in all its objects since all the modes of finitude hitherto considered consciousness self-consciousness etc are embraced in its single totality it may use each and all of these various modes as the media through and in which to appear when it appears in and through these modes of finitude we have the attitude of religion since these modes as we saw differ the religious attitude differs and accordingly we have various types or forms of religion each of these forms in and through which the absolute appears is circumscribed in its nature and process each is per se inadequate to the revelation of complete absolute self-consciousness hence the variety of religions is necessitated by and is indirectly due to the failure of any one type and the inadequacy of every single type to reveal the absolute completely a form of appearance or self-manifestation of the absolute is therefore demanded which will reveal absolute spirit adequately to itself as it essentially is in itself 
here it will know itself so to say face to face and with perfect completeness this form is absolute knowledge hence religion and absolute knowledge are the final stages in the argument of the phenomenology the former is dealt with in the immediately succeeding section seven and its various subsections the latter forms the subject of the concluding section eight of the work end of translator's note chapter seven religion in general in the forms of experience hitherto dealt with which are distinguished broadly as consciousness self-consciousness reason and spirit religion also the consciousness of absolute being in general has no doubt made its appearance but that was from the point of view of consciousness when it has the absolute being for its object absolute being however in its own distinctive nature the self-consciousness of spirit has not appeared in those forms even at the plane of consciousness that is when this takes the shape of understanding there is a consciousness of the supersensuous of the inner being of objective existence but the supersensible the eternal or whatever we care to call it is devoid of selfhood it is merely to begin with something universal which is a long way still from being spirit knowing itself as spirit then there was self-consciousness which came to its final shape in the bereft soul the unhappy consciousness that was merely the pain and sorrow of spirit wrestling to get itself out into objectivity once more but not succeeding the unity of individual self-consciousness with its unchangeable being which is what this stage arrives at remains in consequence a beyond something afar off the immediate existence of reason which we found arising out of that state of sorrow and the special shapes which reason assumes have no form of religion because self-consciousness in the case of reason knows itself or looks for itself in the direct and immediate present on the other hand in the world of the ethical order we met with a type of religion the religion of the nether world this is belief in the fearful and unknown darkness of fate and in the humanities of the spirit of the departed the former being pure negation taking the form of universality the latter the same negation but in the form of particularity absolute being is then in the latter shape no doubt the self and is present as there is no other way for the self to be except present but the particular self is this particular ghostly shade which keeps the universal element fate separated from itself it is indeed a shade a ghost a cancelled and superseded particular and so a universal self but that negative meaning has not yet turned round into this latter positive significance and hence the self so cancelled and transcended still directly means at the same time this particular being this insubstantial reality fate however without self remains the darkness of night devoid of consciousness which never comes to draw distinctions within itself and never attains the clearness of self-knowledge this belief in a necessity that produces nothingness this belief in the nether world becomes belief in heaven because the self which has departed must be united with its universal nature must unfold what it contains in terms of this universality and thus becomes clear to itself this kingdom of belief however we saw unfold its content merely in the element of reflective thought denken without bringing out the true notion begriff and we saw it on that account perish in its final fate that is in the religion of enlightenment here in this type of religion the supersensible beyond which we found in understanding is reinstated again but in such a way that self-consciousness rests and feels satisfied in the mundane present not in the beyond and thinks of the supersensible beyond void and empty unknowable and devoid of all terrors neither as a self nor as power and might in the religion of morality it is at last reinstated that absolute reality is a positive content but that content is bound up with the negativity characteristic of the enlightenment 
the content is an objective being which is at the same time taken back into the self and remains there enclosed and is a content with internal distinctions while its parts are just as immediately negated as they are posited the final destiny however which absorbs this contradictory process is the self conscious of itself as the controlling necessity schicksal, of what is essential and actual spirit knowing its self is in religion primarily and immediately its own pure self-consciousness those modes of it above considered objective spirit spirit estranged from itself and spirit certain of itself together constitute what it is in its condition of consciousness the state in which being objectively opposed to its own world it does not therein apprehend and consciously possess itself but in conscience it brings itself as well as its objective world as a whole into subjection as also its idea and its various specific conceptions and is now self-consciousness at home with itself here spirit represented as an object has the significance for itself of being universal spirit which contains within itself all that is ultimate and essential and all that is concrete and actual yet is not in the form of freely subsisting actuality or of the detached independence of external nature it has a shape no doubt the form of objective being in that it is object of its own consciousness but because this being is put forward in religion with the essential character of being self-consciousness the form or shape assumed is one perfectly transparent to itself and the reality spirit contains is enclosed in it or transcended in it just in the same way as when we speak of all reality its reality is universal reality in the sense of a product of thought since then in religion the peculiar characteristic of what is properly consciousness of spirit does not have the form of detached and external otherness the existence of spirit is distinct from its self-consciousness and its actual reality proper falls outside religion there is no doubt one spirit in both but its consciousness does not embrace both together and religion appears as a part of existence of acting and of striving whose other part is the life lived within its own actual world and we now know that spirit in its own world and spirit conscious of itself as spirit that is spirit in the sphere of religion are the same the completion of religion consists in the two forms becoming identical with one another not merely in its reality being grasped and embraced by religion but conversely it as spirit conscious of itself becomes actual to itself and real object of its own consciousness so far as spirit in religion presents itself to itself it is indeed consciousness and the reality enclosed within it is the shape and garment in which it clothes its idea of itself the reality however does not in this presentation get proper justice done to it that is to say it does not get to be an independent and free objective existence and not merely a garment and conversely because that reality lacks within itself its completion it is a determinate shape or form which does not attain to what it ought to reveal that is spirit conscious of itself that its form might express spirit itself the form would have to be nothing else than spirit and spirit would have to appear to itself or to be actual as it is in its own essential being only thereby too would be attained what may seem to demand the opposite that the object of its consciousness has at the same time the form of free and independent reality but only spirit which is object to itself in the shape of absolute spirit is as much aware of being a free and independent reality as it remains therein conscious of itself since in the first instance self-consciousness and consciousness simply religion and spirit as it is externally in its world or the objective existence of spirit are distinct the latter consists in the totality of spirit so far as its moments are separated from each other and each is set forth by itself these moments however are consciousness self-consciousness reason and spirit spirit that is qua immediate spirit which is not yet consciousness of spirit its totality taken altogether constitutes the mundane existence of spirit as a whole 
spirit as such contains the previous separate embodiments in the form of universal determinations of its own being in those moments just named religion presupposes that these have completely run their course and is their simple totality their absolute self and soul the course which these traverse is moreover in relation to religion not to be pictured as a temporal sequence it is only spirit in its entirety that is in time and the shapes assumed which are specific embodiments of the whole of spirit as such present themselves in a sequence one after the other for it is only the whole which properly has reality and hence the form of pure freedom relatively to anything else the form which takes expression as time but the moments of the whole consciousness self-consciousness reason and spirit have because they are moments no existence separate from one another just as spirit was distinct from its moments we have further in the third place to distinguish from these moments their specific individuated character each of those moments in itself we saw broke up again in a process of development all its own and took various shapes and forms as for example in the case of consciousness sensuous certainty and perception were distinct phases these latter aspects fall apart in time from one another and belong to a specific particular whole for spirit descends from its universality to assume an individual form through specification by determination this determination or mediate element is consciousness self-consciousness and so on now the forms assumed by these moments constitute individuality hence these exhibit and reveal spirit in its individually or concrete reality and are distinguished in time from one another though in such a way that the succeeding retains within it the preceding while therefore religion is the completion of the life of spirit its final and complete expression into which as being their ground its individual moments consciousness self-consciousness reason and spirit return and have returned they at the same time together constitute the objectively existing realization of spirit in its totality as such spirit is real only as the moving process of these aspects which it possesses a process of distinguishing them and returning back into itself in the process of these universal moments is contained the development of religion generally since however each of these attributes was set forth and presented not only in the way it in general determines itself but as it is in and for itself that is as within its own being running its course as a distinct whole there has thus arisen not merely the development of religion generally those independently complete processes pursued by the individual phases and stages of spirit contain at the same time the determinate forms of religion itself spirit in its entirety spirit in religion is once more the process from its immediacy to the attainment of a knowledge of what it implicitly or immediately is and is the process of attaining the state where the shape and form in which it appears as an object for its own consciousness will be perfectly identical with and adequate to its essential nature and where it will behold itself as it is in this development of religion then spirit itself assumes definite forms which constitute the distinctions involved in this process and at the same time a determinate or specific form of religion has likewise an actual spirit of a specific character thus if consciousness self-consciousness reason and spirit belong to self-knowing spirit in general in a similar way the specific shapes which self-knowing spirit assumes appropriate and adopt the distinctive forms which were specifically developed in the cage of each of the stages consciousness self-consciousness reason and spirit the determinate shape assumed in a given case by religion appropriates from among the forms belonging to each of its moments the one adapted to it and makes this its actual spirit this one determinate attitude of religion pervades and permeates all aspects of its actual existence and stamps them with this common feature in this way the arrangement now assumed by the forms and shapes which have thus far appeared is different from the way they appeared in their own order on this point we may note shortly at the outset what is of chief importance 
in the series we considered each moment exhaustively elaborating its entire content evolved and formed itself into a single whole within its own peculiar principle and knowledge was the inner death or the spirit wherein the elements having no subsistence of their own possessed their substance this substance however has now at length made its appearance it is the deep life of spirit certain of itself it does not allow the principle belonging to each individual form to get isolated and become a whole within itself rather it collects all these moments into its own content keeps them together and advances within this total wealth of its concrete actual spirit while all its particular moments take into themselves and receive together in common the light determinate character of the whole this spirit certain of itself and the process it goes through this is their true reality the independent self-subsistence which belongs to each individually thus while the previous linear series in its advance marked the retrogressive steps in it by knots but thence went forward again in one linear stretch it is now as it were broken at these knots these universal moments and radiates into many lines which being bound together into a single bundle combine at the same time symmetrically so that the similar distinctions in which each separately took shape within its own sphere meet together for the rest it is self-evident from the whole argument how this coordination of universal directions just mentioned is to be understood so that it becomes superfluous to remark that these distinctions are to be taken to mean essentially and only moments of the process of development not parts in the case of actual concrete spirit they are attributes of its substance in religion on the other hand they are only predicates of the subject in the same way indeed all forms in general are in themselves or for us contained in spirit and contained in every spirit but the main point of importance in dealing with its reality is solely what determinate character it has in its consciousness in which specific character it has expressed itself or in what shape it knows its essential nature the distinction made between actual spirit and that same spirit which knows itself as spirit or between itself qua consciousness and qua self-consciousness is transcended and done away with in the case where spirit knows itself in its real truth its consciousness and its self-consciousness have come to terms but as religion is here to begin with and immediately this distinction has not yet reverted to spirit it is merely the conception the principle of religion that is established at first in this the essential element is self-consciousness which is conscious of being all truth and which contains all reality within that truth this self-consciousness being consciousness and so aware of an object has itself for its object spirit which knows itself in the first instance immediately is thus to itself spirit in the form of immediacy and the specific character of the shape in which it appears to itself is that of pure simple being this being this bare existence has indeed a filling drawn neither from sensation or manifold matter nor from any other one-sided elements purposes and determinations its filling is solely spirit and is known by itself to be all truth and reality such filling is in this first form not in agreement or identity with its own shape spirit qua ultimate reality is not in accord with its consciousness it is actual only as absolute spirit when it is also to itself in its truth as it is in its certainty of itself or when the extremes into which spirit qua consciousness falls exist for one another in spiritual shape the embodiment adopted by spirit qua object of its own consciousness remains filled by the certainty of spirit and this self-certainty constitutes its substance through this content the degrading of the object to bare objectivity to the form of something that negates self-consciousness disappears the immediate unity of spirit with itself is the fundamental basis or pure consciousness inside which consciousness breaks up into its constituent elements that is an object with subject over against it 
in this way shut up within its pure self-consciousness spirit does not exist in religion as the creator of a nature in general rather what it produces in the course of this process are its forms and shapes qua spirits which together constitute all that it can reveal when it is completely manifested and this process itself is the development of its perfect and complete actuality through the individual aspects thereof that is through its imperfect modes of realization the first realization of spirit is just the principle and notion of religion itself religion as immediate and thus natural religion here spirit knows itself as its object in a natural or immediate shape the second realization is however necessarily that of knowing itself in the shape of transcended and superseded natural existence that is in the form of self this is the religion of art or productive activity for the shape it adopts is raised to the form of self through the productive activity of consciousness by which this consciousness beholds in its object its own action that is sees the self the third realization finally cancels the one-sidedness of the first two the self is as much an immediate self as the immediacy is a self if spirit in the first is in the form of consciousness and in the second in that of self-consciousness it is in the third in the form of the unity of both it has then the shape of what is completely self-contained an und für sich seins and since it is thus presented as it is in and for itself this is the sphere of revealed religion although spirit however here reaches its true shape the very shape assumed and the conscious presentation are an aspect and phase still unsurmounted and from this spirit has to pass over into the life of the notion in order therein completely to resolve the form of objectivity in the notion which embraces within itself this its own opposite it is then that spirit has grasped its own principle the notion of itself as so far only we who analyze spirit have grasped it and its form the element of its existence since this form is the notion is then spirit itself end of section eighteen section nineteen of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter seven a natural religion translator's note the arrangement of the analysis of religion and the divisions into the various subsections are as indicated in the preceding note page six hundred and eighty three determined by the general development of experience that development is from the immediate through mediation to the fusion of immediacy and mediation the stages of the development of experience are consciousness self-consciousness reason the latter leading to its highest level finite spiritual existence the development of religion follows these various ways in which objects are given in experience and the three chief divisions of religion are determined accordingly natural religion is religion at the level of consciousness art religion at the level of self-consciousness revealed religion is religion at the level of reason and spirit each of these is again subdivided and the subdivision follows more or less closely the various subdivisions of these three ultimate levels of experience consciousness etc thus in natural religion we have religion at the level of sense certainty light religion at the level of perception life and religion at the level of understanding the reciprocal relation constituted by the play of forces appears as the relation of the artificer to his own product the general principle is not worked out in detail with the same obviousness in the case of the other two primary types of religion art and revealed religion but the same general method of development is pursued in these cases the historical material before the mind of the writer is as might be expected the various religions which have historically appeared amongst mankind 
these religions are treated however as illustrations of principles dominating the religious consciousness in general rather than as merely historical phenomena with the succeeding argument should be read hegel's philosophy of religion part two sections one and two and part three end of translator's note chapter seven a natural religion spirit knowing spirit is consciousness of itself and is to itself in the form of objectivity it is and is at the same time self-existence fur sich sein it is for self it is the aspect of self-consciousness and is so in contrast to the aspect of its consciousness the aspect by which it relates itself to itself as object in its consciousness there is the opposition and in consequence the specificity of the form in which it appears to itself and knows itself it is with this specificity that we have alone to do in considering religion for its essential unspecified principle its abstract notion has already come to light the distinction of consciousness and self-consciousness however falls at the same time within this notion the form or shape of religion does not contain the existence of spirit in the sense of its being nature detached and free from thought nor in the sense of its being thought detached from existence the shape assumed by religion is existence contained and preserved in thought as well as a thought content which is consciously existent it is by the determinate character of this form in which spirit knows itself that one religion is distinguished from another but we have at the same time to note that the systematic exposition of this knowledge about itself in terms of this particular specific character does not as a fact exhaust the whole meaning of a given actual religion the series of different religions which will come before us just as much set forth again merely the different aspects of a single religion and indeed of every particular religion and the ideas the conscious processes which seem to mark off one concrete religion from another make their appearance in each all the same the diversity must also be looked at as a diversity of religion for while spirit lives in the distinction of its consciousness and its self-consciousness the process it goes through finds its goal in the transcendence of this fundamental distinction and in giving the form of self-consciousness to the given shape which is object of consciousness this distinction however is not eo ipso transcended by the fact that the shapes which that consciousness contains have also the element of self in them and that god is represented as self-consciousness the consciously presented self is not the actual concrete self in order that this like every other more specific determination of the form may in truth belong to this form it has partly to be put into this form by the action of self-consciousness and partly the lower determination must show itself to be cancelled and transcended and comprehended by the higher for what is consciously presented vorgestellt only ceases to be something presented and alien external to which knowledge by the self having produced it and so viewing the determination of the object as its own determination and hence seeing itself in that object by this operation the lower determination that of being something presented has at once vanished for doing anything is a negative process which is carried through at the expense of something else so far as that lower determination still continues to appear it has withdrawn into what is without any essential significance just as on the other hand where the lower still predominates while the higher is also present the one coexists in a selfless way alongside of the other while therefore the various ideas falling within a particular religion no doubt exhibit the whole course its forms take the character of each is determined by the particular unity of consciousness and self-consciousness that is to say by the fact that self-consciousness has taken into itself the determination belonging to the object of consciousness has by its own action made that determination altogether its own and knows it to be the essential one as compared with the others the truth of belief in a given determination of the religious spirit shows itself in this that the actual spirit is constituted after the same manner as the form in which spirit beholds itself in religion 
thus for example the incarnation of god which is found in eastern religion has no truth because the concrete actual spirit of this religion is without the reconciliation this principle implies it is not in place here to return from the totality of specific determinations back to the particular determination and show in what shape the plenitude of all the others is contained within it and within its particular form of religion the higher form when put back under a lower is deprived of its significance for self-conscious spirit belongs to spirit merely in a superficial way and is for it at the level of a presentation the higher form has to be considered in its own peculiar significance and dealt with where it is the principle of a particular religion and is certified and approved by its actual spirit end of section nineteen Section 20 of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 7a, Subsection A. God as Light. Spirit, as the Absolute Being, which is Self-Consciousness, or the Self-Conscious Absolute Being, which is all truth and knows all reality as itself, is to begin with merely its notion and principle in contrast to the reality which it acquires in the process of its conscious activity and this conception is as contrasted with the clear daylight of that explicit development the darkness and night of its inner life in contrast to the existence of its various moments as independent forms and shapes this notion is the creative secret of its birth this secret has its revelation within itself for existence has its necessary place in this notion because this notion is spirit knowing itself and thus possesses in its own nature the moment of being consciousness and of presenting itself objectively we have here the pure ego which in externalizing itself in seeing itself qua universal object has the certainty of self in other words this object is for the ego the fusion of all thought and all reality when the first and immediate cleavage is made within self-knowing absolute spirit its form assumes that character which belongs to immediate consciousness or to sense certainty it beholds itself in the form of being but not being in the sense of what is without spirit containing only the contingent qualities of sensation the kind of being that belongs solely to sense certainty its being is filled with the content of spirit it also includes within it the form which we found in the case of immediate self-consciousness the form of lord and master with reference to the self-consciousness of spirit which retreats from its object this being having as its content the notion of spirit is then the mode of spirit in relation simply to itself the form of having no special form at all in virtue of this characteristic this mode is the pure all-containing all-suffusing light of the east which preserves itself in its formless indeterminate substantiality its counterpart its otherness is the equally simple negative darkness the processes of its own self-abandonment its creations in the unresisting element of its counterpart are bursts of light at the same time in their ultimate simplicity they are its way of becoming something for itself its return from its objective existence streams of fire consuming its embodiment the distinction which it gives itself no doubt thrives abundantly on the substance of existence and grows into and assumes the diverse forms of nature but the essential simplicity of its thought rambles and roves about inconstant and inconsistent enlarges its bounds to measureless extent and its beauty heightened to splendour is lost in its sublimity the content which this state of mere being involves its perceptive activity is therefore an unreal by-play on this substance which merely rises without descending into itself to become subject and secure firmly its distinctions through the self its determinations are merely attributes which do not succeed in attaining independence they remain merely names of the one called by many names this one is clothed with the manifold powers of existence and with the shapes of reality 
as with a soulless selfless ornament they are merely messengers of its mighty power claiming no will of their own visions of its glory voices in its praise this revel of heaving life must however assume the character of distinctive self-existence and give enduring subsistence to its fleeting forms immediate being in which it places itself over against its own consciousness is itself the negative destructive agency which dissolves its distinctions it is thus in truth the self and spirit therefore passes on to know itself in the form of self pure light scatters its simplicity as an infinity of separate forms and presents itself as an offering to self-existence that the individual may have sustainment in its substance End of section 20section twenty one of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm frederick hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter seven a subsection b plants and animals as objects of religion self-conscious spirit passing away from abstract formless essence and going into itself or in other words having raised its immediacy to the level of self makes its simple unity assume the character of a manifold of self-existing entities and is the religion of spiritual sense perception here spirit breaks up into an innumerable plurality of weaker and stronger richer and poorer spirits this pantheism which to begin with consists in the quiescent stability of these spiritual atoms passes into a process of active internal hostility the innocence which characterizes the flower and plant religions and which is merely the selfless idea of self gives way to the seriousness of struggling warring life to the guilt of animal religions the quiescence and impotence of merely contemplative individuality pass into the destructive violence of separate self-existence it is of no avail to have removed the lifelessness of abstraction from the things of perception and to have raised them to the level of realities of spiritual perception the animation of this spiritual kingdom has death in the heart of it owing to the fact of determinateness and the inherent negativity which invades and trenches upon their innocent and harmless indifference to one another owing to this determinateness and negativity the dispersion of passive plant forms into manifold entities becomes a hostile process in which the hatred stirred up by their independent self-existence rages and consumes the actual self-consciousness at work in this dispersed and disintegrated spirit takes the form of a multitude of individualized mutually antipathetic folk spirits who fight and hate each other to the death and consciously accept certain specific forms of animals as their essential reality their god for they are nothing else than spirits of animals their animal life separate and cut off from one another and with no universality consciously present in them the characteristic of purely negative independent self-existence however consumes itself in this active hatred towards one another and through this process involved in its very principle spirit enters into another shape independent self-existence cancelled and abolished is the form of the object a form which is produced by the self or rather is the self-produced the self-consuming self that is the self that becomes a thing the agent at work therefore retains the upper hand over these animal spirits merely tearing each other to pieces and his action is not merely negative but composed and creative the consciousness of spirit is thus now the process which is above and beyond the immediate inherent universal nature as well as transcends the abstract self-existence in isolation since the implicit inherent nature is relegated through opposition to the level of a specific character it is no longer the proper form of absolute spirit but a reality which its consciousness finds lying over against itself as an ordinary existing fact and cancels at the same time this consciousness is not merely this negative cancelling self-existent being but produces its own objective idea of itself self-existence put forth in the form of an object 
this process of production is all the same not yet perfect production it is a conditioned activity the forming of a given material end of section twenty one section twenty two of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter seven a subsection c the artificer spirit then here takes the form of the artificer and this action when producing itself as object but without having as yet grasped the thought of itself is an instinctive kind of working like bees building their cells the first form because immediate has the abstract character of understanding and the work accomplished is not yet in itself endued with spirit the crystals of pyramids and obelisks simple combinations of straight lines with even surfaces and equal relations of parts in which incommensurability of curvature is set aside these are the works produced in strict geometrical form by this artificer owing to the purely abstract intelligible nature of the form it is not in itself the true significance of the form it is not the spiritual self thus either the works produced only receive spirit into them as an alien departed spirit one that has forsaken its living suffusion and permeation with reality and being itself dead enters into these lifeless crystals or they take up an external relation to spirit as something which is itself external and not there as spirit they are related to it as to the orient light which throws its significance on them the separation of elements from which spirit as artificer starts the separation of the implicit essential nature which becomes the material it works upon and independent self-existence which is the aspect of self-consciousness at work this division has become objective in the result achieved its further endeavour has to be directed to cancelling and doing away with the separation of soul and body it must strive to clothe and give embodied shape to soul per se and endow the body with soul the two aspects since they are brought closer to one another bear towards each other in this condition the character of ideally presented spirit and of enveloping shell spirit's oneness with itself contains this opposition of individuality and universality since the aspects of the work produced become closer by performance of it there comes about thereby at the same time the other fact that the work gets nearer to the self-consciousness performing it and that the latter attains in the work knowledge of itself as it truly is in this way however the work merely constitutes to begin with the abstract side of the activity of spirit which does not yet perceive the content of this activity within itself but in its work which is a thing the artificer as such spirit in its entirety has not yet appeared the artificer is still the inner hidden reality which qua entire is present only as broken up into active self-consciousness and the object it has produced the surrounding habitation external reality which to begin with is raised merely to the abstract form of the understanding is worked up by the artificer and made into a more animated form the artificer employs plant life for this purpose which is no longer sacred as in the previous case of inactive impotent pantheism rather the artificer who holds himself to be the self-existent reality takes that plant life as something to be used and degrades it to an external aspect to the level of an ornament but it is not turned to use without some alteration for the worker producing the self-conscious form destroys at the same time the transitoriness inherently characteristic of the immediate existence of this life and brings its organic forms nearer to the more exact and more universal forms of thought the organic form which left to itself grows and thrives in particularity being on its side subjugated by the form of thought elevates in turn these straight lined and level shapes into more animated roundedness a blending which becomes the root of free architecture this dwelling the aspect of the universal element or inorganic nature of spirits 
also includes within it now a form of individuality which brings nearer to actuality the spirit that was formerly separated from existence and external or internal thereto and thus makes the work to accord more with active self-consciousness the worker lays hold first of all on the form of self-existence in general on the forms of animal life that he is no longer directly aware of himself in animal life he shows by the fact that in reference to this he constitutes himself the productive force and knows himself in it as being his own work whereby productive force at the same time is one which is superseded and becomes the hieroglyphic symbol of another meaning the hieroglyph of a thought hence also this force is no longer solely and entirely used by the worker but becomes blended with the shape embodying thought with the human form still the work lacks the form and existence where self as self appears it also fails to express in its very nature that it includes within itself an inner meaning it lacks language the element in which the sense and meaning contained are actually present the work done therefore even when quite purified of the animal aspect and bearing the form and shape of self-consciousness alone is still the silent soundless form which needs the rays of the rising sun in order to have a sound which when produced by light is even then merely noise and not speech shows merely an outer self not the inner self contrasted with this outer self of the form and shape stands the other form which indicates that it has in it an inner being nature turning back into its essential being degrades its multiplicity of life ever individualizing itself and confounding itself in its own process to the level of an external encasing shell which is the covering for the inner being and still this inner being is primarily mere darkness the unmoved the black formless stone both representations contain inwardness and existence the two moments of spirit and both kinds of manifestation contain both moments at once in a relation of opposition the self both as inward and as outward both have to be united the soul of the statue in human form does not yet come out of the inner being is not yet speech objective existence of self which is inherently internal and the inner being of multiform existence is still without voice or sound still draws no distinctions within itself and is still separated from its outer being to which all distinctions belong the artificer therefore combines both by blending the forms of nature and self-consciousness and these ambiguous beings a riddle to themselves the conscious struggling with what has no consciousness the simple inner with the multiform outer the darkness of thought mated with clearness of expression these break out into the language of a wisdom that is darkly deep and difficult to understand with the production of this work the instinctive method of working ceases which in contrast to self-consciousness produced a work devoid of consciousness for here the activity of the artificer which constitutes self-consciousness comes face to face with an inner being equally self-conscious and giving itself expression he has therein raised himself by his work up to the point where his conscious life breaks asunder where spirit greets spirit in this unity of self-conscious spirit with itself so far as it is aware of being embodiment and object of its own consciousness its blending and mingling with the unconscious condition of immediate forms of nature become purified these monsters in form and shape word and deed are resolved and dissolved into a shape which is spiritual an outer which has entered into itself an inner which expresses itself out of itself and in itself they pass into thought which brings forth itself preserves the shape and form suited to thought and is transparent existence spirit is artist end of section twenty two section twenty three of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 7b. 
religion in the form of art spirit has raised the shape in which it is object for its own consciousness into the form of consciousness itself and spirit sets such a form before itself the artificer has given up the external synthesizing activity that blending of the heterogeneous forms of thought and nature when the shape has gained the form of self-conscious activity the artificer has become a spiritual workman if we next ask what the actual spirit is which finds in the religion of art the consciousness of its absolute it turns out that this is the ethical or objective spirit this spirit is not merely the universal substance of all individuals but when this substance is said to have as an objective fact for actual consciousness the form of consciousness this amounts to saying that the substance which is individualized is known by the individuals within it as their proper essence and their own achievement it is for them neither the light of the world in whose unity the self-existence of self-consciousness is contained only negatively only transitorily and beholds the lord and master of its reality nor is it the restless waste and destruction of hostile nations nor their subjection to castes which together constitute the semblance of organization of a completed whole where however the universal freedom of the individuals concerned is wanting rather this spirit is a free nation in which custom and order constitute the common substance of all whose reality and existence each and every one knows to be his own will and his own deed the religion of the ethical spirit however raises it above its actual realization and is the return from its objectivity into pure knowledge of itself since an ethically constituted nation lives in direct unity with its own substance and does not contain the principle of pure individualism of self-consciousness the religion characteristic of its sphere first appears in complete form in severance from its stable security for the reality of the ethical substance rests partly on its quiet unchangeableness as contrasted with the absolute process of self-consciousness and consequently on the fact that this self-consciousness has not yet left its serene life of customary convention and its confident security therein and gone into itself partly again that reality rests on its organization into a plurality of rights and duties as also on its organized distribution into groups of stations and classes each with its particular way of acting which cooperates to form the whole and hence rests on the fact that the individual is contented with the limitation of his existence and has not yet grasped the unrestricted thought of his free self but that serene immediate confidence in the substance of this ethical life returns to trust in self and to certainty of self and the plurality of rights and duties as well as the restricted particular action this involves is the same dialectic process in the sphere of the ethical life as the plurality of things and their various qualities a process which only comes to rest and stability in the simplicity of spirit certain of self the complete fulfillment of the ethical life in free self-consciousness and the destined consummation shiksal, of the ethical world are therefore found when individuality has entered into itself the condition is one of absolute levity on the part of the ethical spirit it has dissipated and resolved into itself all the firmly established distinctions constituting its own stability and the separate components of its own articulated organization and being perfectly sure of itself has attained to boundless cheerfulness of heart and the freest enjoyment of itself this simple certainty of spirit within itself has a double meaning it is quiet stability and solid truth as well as absolute unrest and the disappearance of the ethical order it turns round however into the latter for the truth of the ethical spirit lies primarily just in this substantial objectivity and trust in which the self does not think of itself as free individual and where the self therefore in this inner subjectivity in becoming a free self falls to the ground since then its trust is broken and the substance of the nation cracked spirit which was the connecting medium of the unstable extremes has now come forward as an extreme 
that of self-consciousness taking itself to be essential and ultimate this is spirit certain within itself which mourns over the loss of its world and now produces out of the abstraction of self its own essential being raised far above actual reality at such an epoch art in absolute form comes on the scene at the earlier stage it is instinctive in its operation being absorbed and steeped in existence it works out of and works into this element it does not find its substance in the free life of an ethical order and hence too the self-operating does not consist of free spiritual activity later on spirit goes beyond art in order to gain its higher manifestation that is that of being not merely the substance born and produced out of the self but of being in its manifestation object of this self it seeks at that higher level not merely to bring forth itself out of its own notion but to have its very notion as its form so that the notion and the work of art produced may know each other reciprocally as one and the same since then the ethical substance has withdrawn from its objective existence into its bare self-consciousness this is the aspect of the notion or the activity with which spirit brings itself forward as object it is pure form because the individual in ethical obedience and service has so worked off every unconscious existence and every fixed determination as the substance has itself become this fluid and undifferentiated entity this form is the night in which the substance was betrayed and made itself subject it is out of this night of pure certainty of self that the ethical spirit rises again in a shape freed from nature and its own immediate existence the existence of the pure notion into which spirit has fled from its bodily shape is an individual which spirit selects as the vessel for its sorrow spirit acts in this individual as his universal and his power from which he suffers violence as his element of pathos by having given himself over to which his self-consciousness loses freedom but that positive power belonging to the universal is overcome by the pure self of the individual the negative power this pure activity conscious of its inalienable force wrestles with the unembodied essential being becoming its master this negative activity has turned the element of pathos into its own material and given itself its content and this unity comes out as a work universal spirit individualized and consciously presented end of section twenty three section twenty four of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter seven b subsection a the abstract work of art the first work of art is because immediate abstract and particular on its own side it has to move away from this immediate and objective phase towards self-consciousness while on the other side the latter for itself endeavours in the cult to do away with the distinction which it at first gave itself in contrast to its own spirit and by so doing to produce a work of art inherently endowed with life the first way in which the artistic spirit keeps as far as possible removed from each other its form and its active consciousness is immediate in character the form assumed is there as a thing in general it breaks up into the distinction of particularity which contains the form of the self and universality which represents the inorganic elements in reference to the form adopted and is its environment and habitation this shape assumed obtains its pure form the form belonging to spirit by the whole being raised into the sphere of the pure notion it is not the crystal belonging as we saw to the level of understanding a form which housed and covered a lifeless element or is shown upon externally by a soul nor again is it that commingling of the forms of nature and thought which first arose in connection with plants thought's activity here being still an imitation rather the notion strips off the remnant of root branches and leaves still clinging to the forms 
purifies the forms and makes them into figures in which the crystal's straight lines and surfaces are raised into incommensurable relations so that the animation of the organic is taken up into the abstract form of understanding and at the same time its essential nature incommensurability is preserved for understanding the indwelling god however is the black stone extracted from the animal encasement and suffused with the light of consciousness the human form strips off the animal character with which it was mixed up the animal form is for the god merely an accidental vestment the animal appears alongside its true form and has no longer a value on its own account but has sunk into being a significant sign of something else has become a mere symbol by that very fact the form assumed by the god in itself casts off even the need for the natural conditions of animal existence and hints at the internal arrangements of organic life melted down into the surface of the form and pertaining only to this surface the essential being of the god however is the unity of the universal existence of nature and of self-conscious spirit which in its actuality appears confronting the former at the same time being in the first instance a particular form its existence is one of the elements of nature just as its self-conscious actuality is a particular national spirit but the former is in this unity that element reflected back into spirit nature made transparent by thoughts and united with self-conscious life the form of the gods retains therefore within it its nature element as something transcended as a shadowy obscure memory the utter chaos and confused struggle amongst the elements existing free and detached from each other the non-ethical disordered realm of titans is vanquished and banished to the outskirts of self-transparent reality to the cloudy boundaries of the world which finds itself in the sphere of spirit and is at peace these ancient gods first-born children of the union of light with darkness heaven earth ocean sun earth's aimless typhonic fire and so on are supplanted by forms and shapes which do not but darkly recall those earlier titans and which are no longer things of nature but spirits clarified by the ethical life of self-conscious nations this simple form has thus destroyed within itself restless endless individuation the individuation both in the life of nature which operates with necessity only qua universal essence but is contingent in its actual existence and process and also in the life of a nation which is scattered and broken into particular spheres of action and into individual centres of self-consciousness and has an existence manifold in action and meaning all this individuation the simplicity of this form has abolished and brought together into an individuality at peace with itself hence the condition of unrest stands contrasted with this form confronting quiescent individuality the essential reality stands self-consciousness which being its source and origin has nothing left over for itself except to be pure activity what belongs to the substance the artist gave entirely along with his work to himself however as a specific individuality there belongs in his work no reality he could only have conferred completeness on it by relinquishing his particular nature by vesting himself of his own being and rising to the abstraction of pure action with the first and immediate act of production the separation of the work and his self-conscious activity is not yet healed again the work is therefore not by itself really a spiritual entity it is a whole only when its process of coming to be is taken along with it the obvious and common element in the case of a work of art that it is produced in consciousness and is made by the hand of man is the aspect of the notion existing qua notion and standing in contrast to the work produced and if this notion qua the artist or spectator is unselfish enough to declare the work of art to be per se absolutely spiritual and to forget himself qua agent or onlooker then as against this the notion of spirit has to be insisted on spirit cannot dispense with the moment of being conscious of itself this moment however stands in contrast to the work 
because spirit in this its primary disruption gives the two sides their abstract and specifically contrasted characteristics of doing something and of being a thing and their return to the unity they started from has not yet come about the artist finds out then in his work that he did not produce a reality like himself no doubt there comes back to him from his work a consciousness in the sense that a wandering multitude honours it as the spirit which is their own true nature but this way of animating or spiritualizing his work since it renders him his self-consciousness merely in the form of admiration is rather a confession that the work is not animated in the same manner as the artist since the work comes back to him in the form of gladness in general he does not find in it the pain of his self-discipline and the pain of production nor the exertion and strain of his own toil people may moreover judge the work or bring him offerings and gifts or endue it with their consciousness in whatever way they like if they with their knowledge set themselves over it he knows how much more his act is than what they understand and say if they put themselves beneath it and recognize in it their own dominating essential reality he knows himself as the master of this the work of art hence requires another element for its existence god requires another way of going forth than this in which out of the depths of his creative night he drops into the opposite into externality to the character of a thing with no self-consciousness this higher element is that of language a way of existing which is directly self-conscious existence when individual self-consciousness exists in that way it is at the same time directly a form of universal contagion complete isolation of independent self-existent cells is at once fluent continuity and universally communicated unity of the many selves it is the soul existing as soul the god then which takes language as its medium of embodiment is the work of art inherently spiritualized endowed with a soul a work which directly in its existence contains the pure activity which was apart from and in contrast to the god when existing as a thing in other words self-consciousness when its essential being becomes objective remains in direct relation with itself it is when thus at home with itself in its essential nature pure thought or devotion whose inwardness gets at the same time express existence in the hymn the hymn keeps within it the individuality of self-consciousness and this individual character is at the same time perceived to be there universal devotion kindled in every one is a spiritual stream which in all the manifold self-conscious units is conscious of itself as one and the same function in all alike and a simple state of being spirit being this universal self-consciousness of every one holds in a single unity its pure inwardness as well as its objective existence for others and the independent self-existence of the individual units this kind of language is distinct from another way god speaks which is not that of universal self-consciousness the oracle both in the case of the god of the religions of art as well as of the preceding religions is the necessary and the first form of divine utterance for its very principle implies that god is at once the essence of nature and of spirit and hence has not merely natural but spiritual existence as well in so far as this moment is implied primarily in its principle and is not yet realized in religion the language used is for the religious self-consciousness the speech of an alien and external self-consciousness the self-consciousness which remains alien and foreign to its religious communion is not yet there in the way its essential principle requires it should be the self is simple self-existence and thereby is altogether universal self-existence that self however which is cut off from the self-consciousness of the communion is primarily a mere particular self the content of this its own peculiar and individual form of speech is supplied from the general determinate character which the absolute spirit as such adopts in its religion thus the universal spirit of the east which has not yet particularized its existence utters about the absolute equally simple abstract and universal statements whose substantial content is sublime in the simplicity of its truth but at the same time appears 
because of this universality trivial to the self-consciousness developing further the further developed self which advances to being distinctively for itself rises above the pure pathos of unconscious substance gets the mastery over the objectivity of the principle of light in eastern religion and knows that simplicity of abstract truth to be the inherent reality das ansichseinde which does not possess the form of contingent existence through an utterance of an alien self but is the sure and unwritten law of the gods a law that lives for ever and no man knows what time it came as the universal truth revealed by the light of the world has here returned into what is within or what is beneath and has thus got rid of the form of contingent appearance so too on the other hand in the religion of art because god's form or shape has taken on consciousness and hence particularity in general the peculiar utterance of god who is the spirit of an ethically constituted nation is the oracle which knows its special circumstances and situation and announces what is serviceable to its interest reflective thought however satisfies itself as to the universal truths enunciated because these are known as the essential implicit reality of the nation's life and the utterance of them is thus for such reflection no longer a strange and alien speech but is its very own just as that wise man of old searched in his own thought for what was worthy and good but left it to his daemon to find out and decide the petty contingent content of what he wanted to know whether it was good for him to keep company with this or that person or good for one of his friends to go on a journey and such like unimportant things in the same way the universal consciousness draws the knowledge about the contingent from birds or trees or fermenting earth the steam from which deprives the self-conscious mind of its powers of discrimination for what is accidental is something undiscerned undiscriminated and extraneous and hence the ethical consciousness lets itself as if by a throw of the dice settle the matter in a manner that is similarly undiscriminating and extraneous if the individual by his understanding determines on a certain course and selects after consideration what is useful for him it is the specific nature of his particular character which is the ground of this self-determination the basis is just what is contingent and that knowledge which his understanding supplies as to what is useful for the individual is hence just such a knowledge as that of oracles or of the lot only that he who questions the oracle or lot thereby shows the ethical sentiment of indifference to what is accidental while the former on the contrary treats the inherently contingent as an essential concern of his thought and knowledge higher than both however is to make careful reflection the oracle for contingent action but yet to recognize that this very act reflected on is something contingent because it refers to what is opportune and has a relation to what is particular the true self-conscious existence which spirit receives in the form of speech which is not the utterance of extraneous and so accidental that is not universal self-consciousness is the work of art which we met with before it stands in contrast to the statue which has the character of a thing as the statue is existence in a state of rest the other is existence in a state of transience in the case of the former objectivity is set free and dispenses with the immediate presence of the self proper in the latter on the other hand objectivity is too much bound up with the self attains insufficiently to definite embodiment and is like time no longer there just as soon as it is there the religious cult constitutes the process of the two sides a process in which the divine embodiment in motion within the pure feeling element of self-consciousness and its embodiment at rest in the element of thinghood reciprocally abandon the different character each possesses and the unity which is the underlying principle of their being becomes an existing fact here in the cult the self gives itself a consciousness of the divine being descending from its remoteness into it and this divine being which was formerly the unreal and merely objective thereby receives the proper actuality of self-consciousness 
this principle of the cult is essentially contained and present already in the flow of the melody of the hymn these hymns of devotion are the way the self obtains immediate pure satisfaction through and within itself it is the soul purified which in the purity it thus attains is immediately and only absolute being and is one with absolute being the soul because of its abstract character is not consciousness distinguishing its object from itself and is thus merely the night of its existence and the place prepared for its form the abstract cult therefore raises the self into being this pure divine element the soul brings about the attainment of this purity in a conscious way still it is not yet the self which has descended to the depths of its being and knows itself as evil it is something that merely is a soul which cleanses its exterior with the washing of water and robes it in white while its innermost traverses the path set before itself of labour punishment and reward the way of spiritual discipline of altogether relinquishing its particularity the road by which it reaches the mansions and the fellowship of the blessed this ceremonial cult is in its first form merely in secret that is is merely a performance accomplished subjectively in idea and unrealized it has to become a real act for an unreal act is a contradiction in terms consciousness proper thereby rises to the level of its pure self-consciousness the essential being has in it the significance of a free object through the actual cult this object turns back to the self and in so far as in pure consciousness it has the significance of absolute being dwelling in its purity beyond actual reality this being descends through this mediating process of the cult from its universality into individual form and thus combines and unites with actual reality the way the two sides make their appearance in the act is of such a character that the self-conscious aspect so far as it is actual consciousness finds the absolute being manifesting itself as actual nature on the one hand nature belongs to self-consciousness as its possession and property and stands for what has no existence per se on the other hand nature is its proper immediate reality and particularity which is equally regarded as not truly real and essential and is abrogated at the same time that external nature has the opposite significance for its pure consciousness that is the significance of being the inherently real for which the self sacrifices its own relative unreality just as conversely the self sacrifices the unessential aspect of nature to itself the act is thereby a spiritual movement because it is this double-sided process of cancelling the abstraction of absolute being in the way devotion determines the object and making it something concrete and actual and on the other hand of cancelling the actual in the way the agent determines the object and the self acting and raising it into universality the practice of the religious cult begins therefore with the pure and simple offering up or surrender of a possession which the owner apparently considers quite useless for himself and spills on the ground or lets rise up in smoke by so doing he renounces before the ultimate being of his pure consciousness all possession and right of property and enjoyment thereof renounces personality and the reversion of his action to his self and instead reflects the act into the universal into the absolute being rather than into himself conversely however the objective ultimate being too is annihilated in that very process the animal offered up is the symbol of a god the fruits consumed are the actual living series and bacchus in the former die the powers of the upper law the olympians which has blood and actual life in the latter the powers of the lower law the furies which possesses in bloodless form secret and crafty power the sacrifice of the divine substance so far as it is active belongs to the side of self-consciousness that this concrete act may be possible the absolute being must have from the start implicitly sacrificed itself this it has done in the fact that it has given itself definite existence and made itself an individual animal and fruit of the earth 
the self actively sacrificing demonstrates in actual existence and sets before its own consciousness this already implicit completed self-renunciation on the part of absolute being and replaces that immediate reality which absolute being has by the higher that is that of the self making the sacrifice for the unity which has arisen and which is the outcome of transcending the particularity and separation of the two sides is not merely negative destructive fate but has a positive significance it is merely for the abstract being of the nether world that the sacrifice offered to it is wholly surrendered and devoted and in consequence it is only for that being that the reflection of personal possession and individual self-existence back into the universal is marked distinct from the self as such at the same time however this is only a trifling part and the other act of sacrifice is merely the destruction of what cannot be used and is really the preparation of the offered substance for a meal the feast that cheats the act out of its negative significance the person making the offering at that first sacrifice reserves the greatest share for his own enjoyment and reserves from the latter sacrifice what is useful for the same purpose this enjoyment is the negative power which supersedes the absolute being as well as the unity and this enjoyment is at the same time the positive actual reality in which the objective existence of absolute being is transmuted into self-conscious existence and the self has consciousness of its unity with its absolute this cult for the rest is indeed an actual act although its meaning lies for the most part only in devotion what pertains to devotion is not objectively produced just as the result when confined to the feeling of enjoyment is robbed of its external existence the cult therefore goes further and replaces this defect in the first instance by giving its devotion an objective subsistence since the cult is the common task or the individual task for each and all to do which produces for the honour and glory of god a house for him to dwell in and adornment for his presence by so doing the external objectivity of statuary is partly cancelled for by thus dedicating his gifts and his labours the worker makes god well disposed towards him and looks on his self as attached and appertaining to god furthermore this course of action is not the individual labour of the artist his particularity is dissolved in universality but it is not only the honour of god which is brought about and the blessing of his countenance and favour is not only shed in idea and imagination on the worker the work has also a meaning the reverse of the first which was that of self-renunciation and of honour done to what is alien and external the halls and dwellings of god are for the use of man the treasures preserved there are in time of need his own the honour which god enjoys in his decorative adornment is the honour and glory of a refined artistic and high-spirited nation at the festival season the people adorn their own dwellings their own garments and their establishments too with the furnishings of elegance and grace in this manner they receive a return for their gifts from a responsive and grateful god and receive the proofs of his favour wherewith the nation became bound to the god because of the work done for him not as a hope and a deferred realisation but rather in testifying to his honour and in presenting gifts the nation finds directly and at once the enjoyment of its own wealth and the dormant. End of section 24。section 25 of the Phenomenology of Mind, volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone chapter seven b subsection b the living work of art that nation which approaches its god in the cult of the religion of art is an ethically constituted nation knowing its state and the actions of the state to be the will and the achievement of its own activity this universal spirit confronting the self-conscious nation is consequently not the light of the world which being selfless does not contain the certainty of the individual selves but is only their universal ultimate being and the dominating imperious power wherein they disappear 
the religious cult of this simple unembodied ultimate being gives back therefore to its votaries in the main merely this that they are the nation of their god it secures for them merely their stable subsistence and their bare substance as a whole it does not secure for them their actual self this is indeed rejected for they revere their god as the empty profound not as spirit the cult however of the religion of art on the other hand dispenses with that abstract simplicity of the absolute being and therefore with its profundity but that being which is directly at one with the self is inherently spirit and comprehending truth although not yet known explicitly in other words it does not know the depths of its nature because this absolute then implies self consciousness finds itself at home with it when it appears and in the cult this consciousness receives not merely the general title to its own subsistence but also its self-conscious existence within it just as conversely in a despised and outcast nation whose mere substance is acknowledged the absolute being has not a selfless reality but in a nation whose self is acknowledged as living in its substance from the ceremonial cult then self-consciousness that is at peace and satisfied in its ultimate being turns away as also does the god that has entered into self-consciousness as into its place of habitation this place is by itself the night of mere substance or its pure individuality but no longer the strained and striving individuality of the artist which has not yet reconciled itself with its essential being that gradually becomes objective it is substance satisfied having its pathos within it and in want of nothing because it comes back from mere intuition from objectivity which is overcome and superseded this pathos is by itself the being of the orient a being however which has now set and disappeared within itself and has its own setting self-consciousness within it and so contains existence and reality it has here traversed the process of its actualization descending from its pure essentiality and becoming an objective force of nature and the expressions of this force it is an existence relative to an other an objective existence for the self by which it is consumed the silent inner being of selfless nature attains in its fruits the stage where nature duly prepared and digested is offered as material for the life which has a self in its being useful for food and drink it reaches its highest perfection for therein it is the possibility of a higher existence and comes in touch with spiritual existence in its metamorphosis the spirit of the earth has developed and become partly a silently energizing substance partly spiritual ferment in the first case it is the feminine principle the nursing mother in the other the masculine principle the self-driving force of self-conscious existence in this enjoyment then that orient light of the world is discovered for what it really is enjoyment is the mystery of its being for mysticism is not concealment of a secret or ignorance it consists in the self knowing itself to be one with absolute being and in this latter therefore becoming revealed only the self is revealed to itself or what is manifest is so merely in the immediate certainty of itself but it is just in such certainty that simple absolute being has been placed by the cult as a thing that can be used it has not only existence which is seen felt smelt tasted it is also object of desire and by actually being enjoyed it becomes one with the self and thereby disclosed completely to this self and made manifest when we say of anything it is manifest to reason to the heart it is in point of fact still secret for it still lacks the actual certainty of immediate existence both the certainty regarding what is objective and the certainty of enjoyment a certainty which in religion however is not only immediate and unreflecting but at the same time fully cognitive certainty of self what has thus been through the cult revealed to the self-conscious spirit within itself is simple absolute being and this has been revealed partly as the process of passing out of its dark night of concealment up to the level of consciousness to be there its silently nurturing substance 
partly however as the process of losing itself again in nether darkness in the self and of waiting above merely with the silent yearning of motherhood the more conspicuous moving impulse however is the variously named light of the east and its tumult of heaving life which having likewise desisted from its abstract state of being has first embodied itself in objective existence in the fruits of the earth and then surrendering itself to self-consciousness attained there to its proper realization and now it curvets and careers about in the guise of a crowd of excited fervid women the unrestrained revel of nature in self-conscious form still however it is only absolute spirit in the sense of this simple abstract being not a spirit per se that is discovered to consciousness that is it is merely immediate spirit the spirit of nature its self-conscious life is therefore merely the mystery of the bread and the wine of cirrus and bacchus not of the other the strictly higher gods of olympus whose individuality includes as an essential moment self-consciousness as such spirit has not yet qua self-conscious spirit offered itself up to it and the mystery of bread and wine is not yet the mystery of flesh and blood this unstable divine revel must come to rest as an object and the enthusiasm which did not reach consciousness must produce a work which confronts it as the statue stands over against the enthusiasm of the artist in the previous case a work too that is equally complete and finished yet not as an inherently lifeless but as a living self such a cult is the festival which man makes in his own honour though not imparting to a cult of that kind the significance of the absolute being for it is the ultimate being that is first revealed to him not yet spirit not such a being as essentially takes on human form but this cult provides the basis for this revelation and lays out its moments individually and separately thus we here get the abstract moment of the living embodiment of ultimate being just as formerly we had the unity of both in the state of unconstrained emotional fervency in the place of the statue man thus puts himself as the form elaborated and moulded for perfectly free movement just as the statue is the perfectly free state of quiescence if every individual knows how to play the part at least of a torch-bearer one of them comes prominently forward who is the very embodiment of the movement the smooth elaboration the fluent energy and force of all the members he is a lively and living work of art which matches strength with its beauty and to him is given as a reward for his force and energy the adornment with which the statue was decorated in the former type of religion and the honour of being amongst his own nation instead of a god in stone the highest bodily representation of what the essential being of the nation is in both the representations which have just come before us there is present the unity of self-consciousness and spiritual being but they still lack their due balance and equilibrium in the case of the bacchic revelling enthusiasm the self is beside itself in bodily beauty of form it is spiritual being that is outside itself the gloominess of consciousness in the one case and its wild stammering utterance must be taken up into the transparent existence of the latter and the clear but spiritless form of the latter into the emotional inwardness of the former the perfect element in which the inwardness is as external as the externality is inward is once again language but it is neither the language of the oracle entirely contingent in its content and altogether individual in character nor is it the emotional hymn sung in praise of a merely individual god nor is it the meaningless stammer of delirious bacchantic revelry it has attained to its clear and universal content and meaning its content is clear for the artificer has passed out of the previous state of entirely insubstantial enthusiasm and worked himself into a definite shape which is his own proper existence permeated through all its movements by self-conscious soul and is that of his contemporaries its content is universal for in this festival which is to the honour of man there vanishes the one-sidedness peculiar to figures represented in statues which merely contain a national spirit a determinate character of the godhead the finely built warrior is indeed the honour and glory of his particular nation 
but he is a physical or corporeal individuality in which are sunk out of sight the expanse and depth of meaning the seriousness of significance and the inner character of the spirit which underlies the particular mode of life the cravings the needs and the customs of his nation in relinquishing all this for complete corporeal embodiment spirit has laid aside the particular impressions the special tones and chords of that nature which it as the actual spirit of the nation includes its nation therefore is no longer conscious in this spirit of its special particular character but rather of having laid this aside and of the universality of its human existence End of section twenty five section twenty six of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter seven b subsection c the spiritual work of art the national spirits which find their being in the form of some particular animal coalesce into one single spirit thus it is that the separate artistically beautiful national spirits combine to form a pantheon the element and habitation of which is language pure intuition of self in the sense of universal human nature takes when the national or tribal spirit is actualized this form the national spirit combines with the others which together with it constitute through nature and natural conditions one people in a common undertaking and for this task builds up a collective nation and with that a collective heaven this universality to which spirit attains in its existence is nevertheless merely this first universality which to begin with starts from the individuality of ethical life has not yet overcome its immediacy has not yet built up a single state out of these separate national elements the ethical life of an actual national spirit rests partly on the simple confiding trust of individuals in the whole of their nation partly in the direct share which all in spite of differences of position take in the decisions and acts of its government in the union not in the first instance to secure a permanent order but merely for a common act that freedom of participation on the part of each and all is for the nonce set aside this first community of life is therefore an assemblage of individualities rather than the dominion and control of abstract thought which would rob the individuals of their self-conscious share in the will and act of the whole the assembly of national spirits constitutes a circle of forms and shapes which now embraces the whole of nature as well as the whole ethical world they are too under the supreme command rather than the supreme dominion of one by themselves they are the universal substances embodying what the self-conscious essential reality inherently is and does this however constitutes the moving force and in the first instance at least the centre with which those universal entities are concerned and which to begin with seems to unite in a merely accidental way all that they variously accomplish but it is the return of the divine being to self-consciousness which already contains the reason that self-consciousness forms the centre for those divine forces and conceals their essential unity in the first instance under the guise of a friendly external relation between both worlds the same universality which belongs to this content has necessarily also that form of consciousness in which the content appears it is no longer the concrete acts and deeds of the cult it is an action which is not indeed raised as yet to the level of the notion but only to that of ideas the synthetic connection of self-conscious and external existence the element in which these presented ideas exist language is the earliest language the epic as such which contains the universal content at any rate universal in the sense of completeness of the world presented though not in the sense of universality of thought the minstrel is the individual and actual spirit from whom as a subject of this world it is produced and by whom it is born his pathos is not the deafening powers of nature but mnemosyne recollection a gradually involved inwardness the memory of an essential mode of being once directly present 
he is the organ and instrument whose content is passing away it is not his own self which is of any account but his muse his universal song what however is present in fact has the form of an inferential process where the one extreme of universality the world of gods is connected with individuality the minstrel through the middle term of particularity the middle term is the nation in its heroes who are individual men like the minstrel but only ideally presented and thereby at the same time universal like the free extreme of universality the gods in this epic then what is inherently established in the cult the relation of the divine to the human is set forth and displayed as a whole to consciousness the content is an act of the essential being conscious of itself acting disturbs the peace of the substance and awakens the essential being and by so doing its simple unity is divided into parts and opened up into the manifold world of natural powers and ethical forces the act is the violation of the peaceful earth it is the trench which vivified by the blood of the living calls forth the spirits of the departed who are thirsting for life and who receive it in the action of self-consciousness there are two sides to the business the universal activity is concerned to accomplish the side of the self in virtue of which it is brought about by a collection of actual nations with the prominent individualities at the head of them and the side of the universal in virtue of which it is brought about by their substantial forces the relation of the two however took formerly the character of being the synthetic connection of universal and individual that is of being the process of ideal presentation on this specific character depends the judgment regarding this world the relation of the two is by this means a commingling of both which illogically divides the unity of the action and in a needless fashion throws the act from one side over to the other the universal powers assume the form of individual beings and thus have in them the principle from which action comes when they effect anything therefore this seems to proceed as entirely from them and to be as free as in the case of men hence both gods and men have done one and the same thing the seriousness with which those divine powers go to work is ridiculously unnecessary since they are in point of fact the moving force of the individualities engaged in the acts while the strain and toil of the latter again is an equally useless effort since the former direct and manage everything overzealous mortal creatures who are as nothing are at the same time the mighty self that brings into subjection universal beings violates the gods and procures for them actual reality and an interest in acting just as conversely these powerless gods these impotent universal beings which procure their sustenance from the gifts of men and through men first get something to do are the natural inner principle and the substance of all events as also the ethical material and the pathos of action if their cosmic natures first get reality and the sphere of effectual operation through the free self of individuality it is also the case that they are the universal which withdraws from and avoids this connection remains unrestricted and unconstrained in its own character and by the inexhaustible elasticity of its unity extinguishes the atomic singleness of the individual acting and his various aspects preserves itself in its purity and dissolves all that is individual in the current of its own continuity just as the gods fall into this contradictory relation with the antithetic nature having the form of self in the same way their universality comes into conflict with their own specific character and the relation in which it stands to others they are the eternal and resplendent individuals who exist in their own calm and are removed from the changes of time and the influence of alien forces but they are at the same time determinate elements particular gods and thus stand in relation to others but that relation to others which in virtue of the opposition it involves is one of strife is a comic self-forgetfulness of their eternal nature the determinateness they possess is rooted in the divine subsistence and in its specific limitation has the independence of the whole individuality 
owing to this their characters at once lose the sharpness of their distinctive peculiarity and in their ambiguity blend together one purpose of their activity and their activity itself being directed against an other and so against an invincible divine force are a contingent and futile piece of bravado which passes away at once and transforms the pretence of seriousness in the act into a harmless self-confident piece of sport with no result and no issue if however in the nature of their divinity the negative element the specific determinateness of that nature appears merely as the arbitrariness of their activity and as the contradiction between the purpose and result and if that independent self-confidence outweighs and overbalances the element of determinateness then by that very fact the pure force of negativity confronts and opposes their nature and moreover with a power to which it must finally submit and over which it can in no way prevail they are the universal and the positive as against the individual self of mortals which cannot hold out against their power and might but the universal self for that reason hovers over these mortal selves and over this whole world of ideal presentation to which the entire content belongs and is for them the empty form of bare necessity not determined conceptually a mere event to which they stand related selfless and sorrowing for these determinate natures do not find themselves in this purely formal necessity this necessity however is the unity of the notion a unity dominating and controlling the contradictory independent subsistence of the individual moments a unity in which the inconsistency and fortuitousness of their action is coherently regulated and the sportive character of their acts receives its serious value in those moments themselves the content of the world of ideal presentation carries on its process in the midst unrestrained and detached by itself gathering round the individuality of some hero who however feels the strength and splendour of his life broken and mourns the early death he sees ahead of him for the actual individuality firmly fixed in itself is isolated and excluded to the utmost point and severed into its elements which have not yet found each other and united the one individual element the abstract unreal moment is necessity which takes no share in the life of the mediating term just as little as does the other the concrete real individual element the minstrel who keeps himself outside it and disappears in what he ideally presents both extremes must get nearer the content the one necessity has to get filled with it the other the language of the minstrel must have a share in it and the content formerly left to itself must preserve in it the certainty and the fixed character of the negative this higher language that of tragedy gathers and keeps more closely together the dispersed and disintegrated moments of the inner essential world and the world of action the substance of the divine falls apart in accordance with the nature of the notion into its shapes and forms and their movement is likewise in conformity with that notion in regard to form the language here ceases to be narrative in virtue of the fact that it enters into the content just as the content ceases to be merely one that is ideally presented the hero is himself the spokesman and the representation given brings before the audience who are also spectators self-conscious human beings who know their own rights and purposes the power and the will belonging to their specific nature and who know how to state them they are artists who do not express with unconscious naivete and naturalness the merely external aspect of what they begin and what they decide upon as is the case in the language accompanying ordinary action in actual life they make the very inner being external they prove the righteousness of their action and the pathos controlling them is soberly asserted and definitely expressed in its universal individuality free from all accident of circumstance and the particular peculiarities of personalities lastly it is in actual human beings that these characters get existence human beings who impersonate heroes and represent them in actual speech not in the form of a narrative but speaking in their own person just as it is essential for a statue to be made by human hands so is the actor essential to his mask 
not as an external condition from which artistically considered we have to abstract or so far as abstraction must certainly be made we thereby state just that art does not yet contain in it the true and proper self the general ground on which the movement of these shapes produced from the notion takes place is the consciousness of the first form of language where the content is ideally presented and its details spread out without reference to self it is the commonality in general whose wisdom finds utterance in the chorus of the elders in the powerlessness of this chorus the generality finds its representative because the common people itself compose merely the positive and passive material for the individuality of the government confronting it lacking the power to negate and oppose it is unable to hold together and keep within bounds the riches and varied fullness of divine life it allows each individual moment to go off its own way and in its hymns of honour and reverence praises each individual moment as an independent god now this god and now again another where however it detects the seriousness of the notion and perceives how the notion proceeds to deal with these forms shattering them as it goes along and where it comes to see how badly its praised and honoured gods come off when they venture on the ground where the notion holds sway there is not itself the negative power actively setting to work but keeps itself within the abstract selfless thought of such power confines itself to the consciousness of alien and external destiny and produces the empty wish to tranquillize and feeble ineffective talk intended to appease in its terror before the higher powers which are the immediate arms of the substance in its terror before their struggle with one another and before the simple and uniform action of that necessity which crushes them as well as the living beings bound up with them in its compassion for these living beings whom it knows at once to be the same with itself it is conscious of nothing but ineffective horror of this whole process conscious of equally helpless pity and in fine the mere empty piece of surrender to necessity whose work is apprehended neither as the necessary act of character nor as the action of the absolute being within itself spirit does not appear in its dissociated multiplicity on the plane of this spectacular consciousness the indifferent ground as it were of presentation it comes on the scene in the simple diremption of the notion its substance manifests itself therefore merely torn asunder into its two extreme powers these elementary universal beings are at the same time self-conscious individualities heroes who put their conscious life into one of these powers find therein determinateness of character and procure their effective activity and reality this universal individualization descends again as will be remembered to the immediate reality of existence proper and is presented before a crowd of spectators who find in the chorus their image and counterpart or rather their own thought giving itself expression the content and movement of spirit which is object to itself here have already been considered as the nature and realization of the substance of ethical life in its form of religion spirit attains to consciousness about itself or reveals itself to its consciousness in its purer form and its simpler mode of embodiment if then the ethical substance by its very principle broke up as regards its content into two powers which were defined as divine and human law law of the nether world and law of the upper world the one the family the other state sovereignty the first bearing the impress and character of woman the other that of man in the same way the previously multiform circle of gods with its wavering and unsteady characteristics confines itself to these powers which owing to this feature are brought closer to individuality proper for the previous dispersion of the whole into manifold abstract forces which appear hypostatized is the dissolution of the subject which comprehends them merely as moments in itself and individuality is therefore only the superficial form of those entities conversely a further distinction of characters than that just named is to be imputed to contingent and inherently external personality at the same time the essential nature in the case of ethical substance gets divided in its form that is with respect to knowledge 
spirit when acting appears qua consciousness over against the object on which its activity is directed and which in consequence is determined as the negative of the knowing agent the agent finds himself thereby in the opposition of knowing and not knowing he takes his purpose from his own character and knows it to be essential ethical fact but owing to the determinateness of his character he knows merely the one power of substance the other remains for him concealed and out of sight the objectively present reality therefore is one thing in itself and another for consciousness the higher and lower right come to signify in this connection the power that knows and reveals itself to consciousness and the power concealing itself and lurking in the background the one is the aspect of light the god of the oracle who as regards its natural aspect light has sprung from the all-illuminating sun knows all and reveals all phoebus and zeus who is his father but the commands of this truth-speaking god and his proclamations of what is are really deceptive and fallacious for this knowledge is in its very principle directly not knowledge because consciousness in acting is inherently this opposition he who had the power to unlock the riddle of the sphinx and he too who trusted with childlike confidence are therefore both sent to destruction through what the god reveals to them the priestess through whose mouth the gracious god speaks is in nothing different from the equivocal sisters of fate who drive their victim to crime by their promises and who by the double-tongued equivocal character of what they give out as a certainty deceive the king when he relies upon the manifest and obvious meaning of what they say there is a type of consciousness that is purer than the latter which believes in witches and more discriminating more thorough and more solid than the former which puts its trust in the priestess and the gracious god this type of consciousness therefore lets his revenge tarry for the revelation which the spirit of his father makes regarding the crime that did him to death and institutes other proofs in addition for the reason that the spirit giving the revelation might possibly be the devil this mistrust has good grounds because the knowing consciousness takes its stand on the opposition between certainty of itself on the one hand and the objective essential reality on the other ethical rightness which insists that actuality is nothing per se in opposition to absolute law finds out that its knowledge is one-sided its law merely a law of its own character and that it has laid hold of merely one of the powers of the substance the act itself is this inversion of what is subjectively known into its opposite into objective existence turns round what is right from the point of view of character and knowledge into the right of the very opposite with which the former is bound up in the essential nature of the substance turns it into the furies who embody the right of the other power and character awakened into hostility the lower right sits with zeus and throne and enjoys equal respect and homage with the god revealed and known to these three supernatural beings the world of the god of the chorus is limited and restricted by the acting individuality the one is the substance the power presiding over the hearth and home and the spirit worshipped by the family as well as the universal power dominating state and government since this distinction belongs to the substance as such it is when ideally presented not individualized as two distinct forms of the substance but has in actual reality the two persons of its characters on the other hand the distinction between knowing and not knowing falls within each of the actual self-consciousnesses and only in abstraction in the element of universality does it get divided into two individual shapes for the self of the hero only exists as a whole consciousness and hence includes essentially the whole of the distinction belonging to the form but its substance is determinate and only one side of the content distinguished belongs to him hence both sides of consciousness which have in concrete reality no separate individuality peculiarly their own receive when ideally represented each its own particular form the one that of the god revealed the other that of the furies keeping themselves concealed in part both enjoy equal honour while again the form assumed by the substance zeus is the necessity of the relation of the two to one another the substance is the relation one that knowledge is for itself but finds its truth in what is simple 
too that the distinction through and which actual consciousness exists has its basis in that inner being which destroys it three that the clear conscious assurance of certainty has its confirmation in forgetfulness consciousness disclosed this opposition by action through doing something acting in accordance with the knowledge revealed it finds out the deceptiveness of that knowledge and being committed in view of the inner meaning to one of the attributes of substance it did violence to the other and thereby gave the latter right as against itself when following that god who knows and reveals himself it really seized hold of what is not revealed and repents of having trusted the knowledge whose equivocal character since this is its very nature had to come also before it and admonition there an end to be found the frenzy of the priestess the inhuman shape of the witches the voices of trees and birds dreams and so on are not ways in which truth appears they are admonitory signs of deception of want of discernment of the individual and accidental character of knowledge or what comes to the same thing the opposite power which consciousness has violated is present as express law and authentic right whether law of the family or law of the state while consciousness on the other hand pursued its own proper knowledge and hid from itself what was revealed the truth however of the opposing powers of content and consciousness is the final result that both are equally right and hence in their opposition which comes about through action are equally wrong the process of action proves their unity in the mutual overthrow of both powers and the self-conscious characters the reconciliation of the opposition with itself is the leth of the netherworld in the form of death or the leth of the upper world in the form of absolution not from guilt for consciousness cannot deny its guilt because the act was done but from the crime and of the atoning consolation and peace of soul which absolution gives both are forgetfulness the disappearance of the reality and action of the powers of the substance its component individualities and of the powers of the abstract thought of good and evil for none of them by itself is the real essence this consists in the undisturbed calm of the whole within itself the immovable unity of fate the quiescent existence and hence want of activity and vitality in the family and government and the equal honour and consequent indifferent unreality of apollo and the furies and the return of their spiritual life and activity into zeus solely and simply this destiny completes the depopulation of heaven of that unthinking mixture of individuality and ultimate being a blending whereby the action of this absolute being appears as something incoherent inconsistent contingent unworthy of itself for individuality when attaching in a merely superficial way to absolute being is unessential the expulsion of such unreal insubstantial ideas which was demanded by the philosophers of antiquity thus already has its beginning in tragedy in general through the fact that the division of the substance is controlled by the notion and hence individuality is the essential individuality and the specific determinations are absolute characters the self-consciousness represented in tragedy knows and acknowledges on that account only one highest power zeus this zeus is known and acknowledged only as the power of the state or of the hearth and home and in the opposition falling inside knowledge merely as the father of the particular knowledge assuming a definite shape he is the zeus acknowledged in the taking of oaths the zeus of the furies the zeus of what is universal of the inner being dwelling in concealment the further moments taken from the notion begriff and dispersed in the form of ideal presentation Vorstellung, moments which the chorus permits to hold good one after the other are on the other hand not the pathos of the hero they sink to the level of passions in the hero to the level of accidental insubstantial moments which the impersonal chorus no doubt praises but which are not capable of constituting the character of heroes nor of being expressed and regarded by them as their real nature but further the persons of the divine being itself as well as the characters of its substance coalesce into the simplicity of what is devoid of consciousness this necessity has in contrast to self-consciousness the characteristic of being the negative power of all the forms that appear 
a power in which they do not recognize themselves but perish therein the self appears as merely allotted amongst the different characters and not as the mediating factor of the process but self-consciousness the simple certainty of self is in point of fact the negative power the unity of zeus the unity of the substantial essence and abstract necessity it is the spiritual unity into which everything returns because actual self-consciousness is still distinguished from the substance and fate it is partly the chorus or rather the crowd looking on whom this movement of the divine life fills with fear as being something alien and strange or in whom this movement as something closely touching themselves produces merely the emotion of passive pity partly again so far as consciousness co-operates and belongs to the various character this alliance is of an external kind is a hypocrisy because the true union that of self fate and substance is not yet present the hero who appears before the onlookers breaks up into his mask and the actor into the person of the play and the actual self the self-consciousness of the heroes must step forth from its mask and be represented as knowing itself to be the fate both of the gods of the chorus and of the absolute powers themselves and as being no longer separated from the chorus the universal consciousness comedy has then first of all the aspect that actual self-consciousness represents itself as the fate of the gods these elemental beings are qua universal moments no definite self and are not actual they are indeed endowed with the form of individuality but this is in their case merely put on and does not really and truly suit them the actual self has no such abstract moment as its substance and content the subject therefore is raised above such a moment as it would be above a particular property and when clothed with this mask gives utterance to the irony of such a property trying to be something on its own account the pretentious claims of the universal abstract nature are shown up and discovered in the actual self it is seen to be caught and held in a concrete reality and lets the mask drop just when it wants to be something right the self appearing here in its significance as something actual plays with the person which it once puts on in order to be its own person but it breaks away from this seeming and pretense just as quickly again and comes out in its own nakedness and usual character which it shows not to be distinct from the proper self the actor nor again from the onlooker this general dissolution which the formerly embodied essential nature as a whole undergoes when it assumes individuality becomes in its content more serious and hence more petulant and bitter in so far as the content possesses its more serious and necessary meaning the divine substance combines the meaning of natural and ethical essentiality as regards the natural element actual self-consciousness shows in the very fact of applying elements of nature for its adornment for its abode and so on and again in feasting on its own offering that itself is the fate to which the secret is disclosed no matter what its position with regard to the independent substantiality of nature in the mystery of the bread and wine it makes its very own this self-subsistence of nature together with the significance of inner reality and in comedy it is conscious of the irony lurking in this meaning so far again as this meaning contains the essence of ethical reality it is partly the nation in its two aspects of the state or demos proper and individual family life partly however it is self-conscious pure knowledge or rational thought of the universal demos the general mass which knows itself as master and governor and is also aware of being the insight and intelligence which demand respect exerts compulsion and is befooled through the particularity of its actual life and exhibits the ludicrous contrast between its own opinion of itself and its immediate existence between its necessity and contingency its universality and its vulgarity if the principle of its individual existence cut off from the universal breaks out in the proper form of actual reality and openly usurps and administers the commonwealth to which it is a secret harm and detriment then immediately there is disclosed the contrast between the universal in the sense of an abstract theory and that with which practice is concerned 
there stands exposed the entire emancipation of the ends and aims of the mere individual from all universal order and the scorn the mere individual shows for such order rational thinking removes contingency of form and shape from the divine being and in opposition to the uncritical wisdom of the chorus a wisdom giving utterance to all sorts of ethical maxims and stamping with validity and authority a multitude of laws and specific conceptions of duty and of right rational thought lifts these into the simple ideas of the beautiful and the good the process of this abstraction is the consciousness of the dialectic involved in these maxims and laws themselves and hence the consciousness of the disappearance of that absolute validity with which they previously appeared since the contingent character and superficial individuality which mere presentation lent to the divine beings vanish they are left as regard their natural aspect with merely the nakedness of their immediate existence they are clouds a passing vapour like those presentations having passed in accordance with their essential character as determined by thought into the simple thoughts of the beautiful and the good these latter submit to being filled with every kind of content the force of dialectic knowledge puts determinate laws and maxims of action at the mercy of the pleasure and levity of youth led astray therewith and gives weapons of deception into the hands of solicitous and apprehensive old age restricted in its interests to the individual details of life the pure thoughts of the beautiful and the good thus display a comic spectacle through their being set free from opinion which contains both their determinateness in the sense of content and also their absolute determinateness the firm hold of consciousness upon them they become empty and on that very account the sport of the private opinion and caprice of any chance individuality here then the fate formerly without consciousness consisting in mere rest and forgetfulness and separated from self-consciousness is united with self-consciousness the individual self is the negative force through which and in which the gods as also their moments nature as existent fact and the thoughts of their determinate characters pass away and disappear at the same time the individual self is not the mere vacuity of disappearance but preserves itself in this very nothingness holds to itself and is the sole and only reality the religion of art is fulfilled and consummated in it and is come full circle through the fact that it is the individual consciousness in its certainty of self which is shown to be this absolute power this latter has lost the form of something ideally presented vorgestellt, separated from and alien to consciousness in general as were the statue and also the living embodiment of beauty or the content of the epic and the powers and persons of tragedy nor again is the unity the unconscious unity of the cult and the mysteries rather the self proper of the actor coincides with the part he impersonates just as the onlooker is perfectly at home in what is represented before him and sees himself playing in the drama before him what this self-consciousness beholds is that that which assumes the form of essentiality as against self-consciousness is resolved and dissolved within its thought its existence and action and is quite at its mercy it is the return of everything universal into certainty of self a certainty which in consequence is this complete loss of fear of everything strange and alien and complete loss of substantial reality on the part of what is alien and external such certainty is a state of spiritual good health and of self-abandonment thereto on the part of consciousness in a way that outside this kind of comedy is not to be found anywhere end of section twenty six section twenty seven of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 7c. Revealed Religion. Part 1. Through the religion of art, spirit has passed from the form of substance into that of subject. For art brings out its shape and form, and imbues it with the nature of action, or establishes in it the self-consciousness which merely disappears in the awesome substance and in the attitude of simple trust does not itself comprehend itself 
this incarnation in human form of the divine being begins with the statue which has in it only the outward shape of the self while the inner life thereof its activity falls outside it in the case of the cult however both aspects have become one in the outcome of the religion of art this unity in being completely attained has at the same time also passed over to the extreme of self in the type of spirit which becomes perfectly certain of itself in the individual existence of consciousness all essential content is swallowed up and submerged the proposition which gives this light-hearted action expression runs thus the self is absolute being the being which was substance and in which the self was the accidental element has dropped to the level of a predicate and in this self-consciousness over against which nothing appears in the form of objective being spirit has lost its aspect of consciousness this statement the self is absolute being belongs as is evident on the face of it to the non-religious the concrete actual spirit and we have to recall what the form thereof is which gives expression to it this form will contain at once the movement of that spirit and its conversion which lowers the self to the note of a predicate and raises substance into subject this we must understand to take place in such a way that the converse statement does not per se or for us make substance into subject or what is the same thing does not reinstate substance again so that the consciousness of spirit is carried back to its commencement in natural religion but rather in such a way that this conversion is brought about for and through self-consciousness itself since this latter consciously gives itself up it is preserved and maintained in thus relinquishing itself and remains the subject of the substance but as being likewise self-relinquished it has at the same time the consciousness of this substance in other words since by thus offering itself up it produces substance as subject this subject remains its own very self if then taking the two propositions in the first the subject merely disappears in substantiality and in the second the substance is merely a predicate and both sides are thus present in each with contrary inequality of value the result hereby effected is that the union and transfusion of both natures subject and substance become apparent in this union both with equal value and worth are at once essential and also merely moments hence it is that spirit is equally consciousness of itself as its objective substance as well as simple self-contained self-consciousness the religion of art belongs to the spirit animating the ethical sphere the spirit which we formerly saw sink and disappear in the condition of right that is in the proposition the self as such the abstract person is absolute being in ethical life the self is absorbed in the spirit of its nation it is universality filled to the full simple abstract individuality however rises out of this content and its light-heartedness clarifies and rarifies it till it becomes a person and attains the abstract universality of right here the substantial reality of the ethical spirit is lost the abstract insubstantial spirits of national individuals are gathered together into a pantheon not into a pantheon represented in idea vorstellung whose impotent form lets each alone to do as it likes but into the pantheon of abstract universality of pure thought which disembodies them and bestows on the spiritless self on the individual person complete existence on its own account but this self through its being empty has let the content go this consciousness is being merely within itself its own very existence the legal recognition of the person is an unfulfilled empty abstraction it thus really possesses merely the thought of itself in other words as it there exists and knows itself as object it is something unreal consequently it is merely stoic independence the independence of thought and this finds by passing through the process of scepticism its ultimate truth in that form we called the unhappy self-consciousness the soul of despair 
this knows how the case stands with the actual claims to validity which the abstract legal person puts forward as also with the validity of these claims in pure thought in stoicism it knows that a vindication of such claims means really being altogether lost it is just this loss become conscious of itself and is the surrender and relinquishment of its knowledge about itself we see that this unhappy consciousness constitutes the counterpart and the complement of the perfectly happy consciousness that of comedy all divine reality goes back into this latter type of consciousness it means in other words the complete relinquishment and emptying of substance the former on the contrary is conversely the tragic fate that befalls certainty of self which aims at being absolute at being self-sufficient it is consciousness of the loss of everything of significance in this certainty of itself and of the loss even of this knowledge or certainty of self the loss of its substance as well as of self it is the bitter pain which finds expression in the cruel words god is dead in the condition of right or law then the ethical world has vanished and its type of religion has passed away in the mood of comedy the unhappy consciousness the soul of despair is just the knowledge of all this loss it has lost both the worth and dignity it attached to its immediate personality as a legal person as well as that attaching to its personality when reflected in the medium of thought in the case of stoicism trust in the eternal laws of the gods is silenced just as the oracles are dumb whose work it was to know what was right in particular cases the statues set up are now corpses in stone whence the animating soul has flown while the hymns of praise are words from which all belief has gone the tables of the gods are bereft of spiritual food and drink and from his games and festivals man no more receives the joyful sense of his unity with the divine being the works of the muse lack the force and energy of the spirit which derived the certainty and assurance of itself just from the crushing ruin of gods and men they are themselves now just what they are for us beautiful fruit broken off the tree a kindly fate has passed on those works to us as a maiden might offer such fruit off a tree it is not their actual life as they exist that is given us not the tree that bore them not the earth and the elements which constituted their substance nor the climate that determined their constitutive character nor the change of seasons which controlled the process of their growth so too it is not their living world that fate preserves and gives us with those works of ancient art not the spring and summer of that ethical life in which they bloomed and ripened but the veiled remembrance alone of all this reality our action therefore when we enjoy them is not that of worship through which our conscious life might attain its complete truth and be satisfied to the full our action is external it consists in wiping off some drop of rain or speck of dust from these fruits and in place of the inner elements composing the reality of ethical life a reality that environed created and inspired these works we erect in prolix detail the scaffolding of the dead elements of their outward existence language historical circumstances etc all this we do not in order to enter into their very life but only to represent them ideally or pictorially vorstellen, within ourselves but just as the maiden who hands us the plucked fruits is more than the nature which presented them in the first instance the nature which provided all their detailed conditions and elements tree air light and so on since in a higher way she gathers all this together into the light of her self-conscious eye and her gesture in offering the gifts so too the spirit of the fate which presents us with those works of art is more than the ethical life realized in that nation for it is the inwardizing in us in the form of conscious memory erinnerung, of the spirit which in them was manifested in an outward external way it is the spirit of the tragic fate which collects all those individual gods and attributes of the substance into the one pantheon into the spirit which is itself conscious of itself as spirit all the conditions for its production are present and this totality of its conditions constitutes the development of it its notion 
or the inherent production of it the cycle of the creations of art embraces in its scope all forms in which the absolute substance relinquishes itself the absolute substance is in the form of individuality as a thing as an object existing for sense experience as mere language or the process of that form whose existence does not get away from the self and is a purely evanescent object as immediate unity with universal self-consciousness when inspired with enthusiasm as mediated unity when performing the acts of the cult as corporeal embodiment of the self in a form of beauty and finally as existence lifted into ideal representation Wurzelung, and the expansion of this existence into a world which at length gathers its content together into universality a universal which is at the same time pure certainty and assurance of itself these forms and on the other side the world of personality and legal right the wild and desert waste of content with its constituent elements set free and detached as also the thought constituted personality of stoicism and the unresting disquiet of scepticism these compose the periphery of the circle of shapes and forms which attend an expectant and eager throng round the birthplace of spirit as it becomes self-consciousness their centre is the yearning agony of the unhappy despairing self-consciousness a pain which permeates all of them and is the common birth pang at its production the simplicity of the pure notion which contains those forms as its moments spirit here has in it two sides which are above represented as the two converse statements one is this that substance empties itself of itself and becomes self-consciousness the other is the converse that self-consciousness empties itself of itself and makes itself into the form of thing or makes itself universal self both sides have in this way met each other and in consequence their true union has arisen the relinquishment or kenosis on the part of the substance its becoming self-consciousness expresses the transition into the opposite the unconscious transition of necessity in other words that it is implicitly self-consciousness conversely the emptying of self-consciousness expresses this that implicitly it is universal being or because the self is pure self-existence which is at home with itself in its opposite that the substance is self-consciousness explicitly for the self and just on that account is spirit of this spirit which has left the form of substance behind and enters existence in the shape of self-consciousness we may say therefore if we wish to use terms drawn from the process of natural generation that it has a real mother but a potential or an implicit father for actual reality or self-consciousness and implicit being in the sense of substance are its two moments and by the reciprocity of their kenosis each relinquishing or emptying itself of itself and becoming the other spirit thus comes into existence as their unity in so far as self-consciousness in a one-sided way grasps only its own relinquishment although its object is thus for it at once both existence and self and it knows all existence to be spiritual in nature yet true spirit has not become thereby objective for it for so far being in general or substance would not necessarily from its side be also emptied of itself and become self-consciousness in that case then all existence is spiritual reality merely from the standpoint of consciousness not inherently in itself spirit in this way has merely a fictitious or imaginary existence this fanciful imagination is fantastic extravagance of mind which introduces into nature as well as history the world and the mythical ideas of early religions another inner esoteric meaning different from what they on the face of them bear directly to consciousness and in particular in the case of religions another meaning than the self-consciousness whose religions they were could find and admit to be there but this meaning is one that is borrowed a garment which does not cover the nakedness of the outer appearance and secures no belief and respect it is no more than murky darkness and the peculiar crazy twist of consciousness 
if then this meaning of the objective is not to be bare fancy and imagination it must be inherent and essential an sich that is must at once arise in consciousness as springing from the very notion and must come forward in its necessity it is thus that self-knowing spirit has arisen it has arisen by means of its necessary process through the knowledge of immediate consciousness that is of consciousness of the immediately existing object this notion which being immediate had also for consciousness the form of immediacy has in the second place taken on the form of self-consciousness essentially and inherently that is by just the same necessity of the notion by which being or immediacy the abstract object of sense consciousness renounces itself and becomes for consciousness ego the immediate entity an sich or objectively existent necessity is however different from the subjective thinking entity or the knowledge of necessity a distinction which at the same time does not lie outside the notion for the simple unity of the notion is itself immediate being the notion is at once what empties or relinquishes itself or the explicit unfolding of directly apprehended angeschaut necessity and is also at home with itself in that necessity knows it and comprehends it the immediate inherent nature of spirit which takes on the form of self-consciousness means nothing else than that the concrete actual world spirit has reached this knowledge of itself it is then too that this knowledge first enters its consciousness and enters it as truth how that came about has already been explained that absolute spirit has taken on the form of self-consciousness inherently and necessarily and has done so too as a conscious fact this position appears now as the belief of the world the belief that spirit exists in fact as a definite self-consciousness that is as an actual human being that spirit is an object for immediate experience that the believing mind sees feels and hears this divinity taken thus it is not an imagination not a fancy it is actual in the believer consciousness in that case does not set out from its own inner life does not start from thought and enclose the thought of god along with existence rather it sets out from immediate present existence and finds god there the moment of immediate existence is present as an element in the notion and present in such a way that the religious spirit on the return of all ultimate reality into consciousness has become simple positive self just as the actual spirit as such in the case of the unhappy consciousness was just this simple self-conscious negativity the self of the definitely existent spirit has in that way the form of complete immediacy it is neither set up as something thought or imaginatively represented nor as something produced as is the case with the immediate self both in natural religion and in religion as art rather this concrete god is beheld sensuously and immediately as a self as a real individual human being only so is it a self-consciousness this incarnation of the divine being its having essentially and directly the form of self-consciousness is the simple content of absolute religion here the divine being is known as spirit this religion is the divine being's consciousness concerning itself that it is spirit for spirit is knowledge of itself in its state of self-relinquishment the absolute reality which is the process of retaining its harmony and identity with itself in its otherness this however is substance so far as in its accidents substance at the same time turns back into itself and does so not as being indifferent towards something unessential and consequently finding itself in some alien element but as being there within itself that is so far as it is subject or self in this form of religion the divine being is on that account revealed its being revealed obviously consists in this that what it is is consciously known it is however known just in its being known as spirit as a being which is essentially self-consciousness 
there is something in the object always concealed from consciousness when the object is for consciousness an other something alien and extraneous and when consciousness does not know the object as itself this concealment this secrecy ceases when the absolute being qua spirit is object of consciousness for here in its relation to consciousness the object is in the form of self that is consciousness at once and immediately knows itself there or is manifest revealed to itself in the object itself is manifest to itself merely in its own certainty of self the object it has is the self self however is nothing alien and extraneous but inseparable unity with itself the immediate universal it is the pure notion pure thought or self-existence being for self which is immediately being and therewith being for another and qua this being for another is immediately turned back into itself and is at home with itself by sich it is thus the truly and solely revealed the good the righteous the holy creator of heaven and earth etc all these are predicates of a subject universal moments which have their hold on this central point and only are when consciousness goes back into thought as long as it is they that are known their ground and essential being the subject itself is not yet revealed and in the same way the specific determinations of the universal are not this universal itself the subject itself and consequently this pure universal too is however revealed as self for this self is just this inner being reflected into itself the inner being which is immediately given and is the proper certainty of that other self for which it is object to be in its notion that which reveals and is revealed this is then the true form of spirit and moreover this form its notion is alone its very essence and its substance spirit is known as self-consciousness and to this self-consciousness it is directly revealed for it is this self-consciousness itself the divine nature is the same as the human and it is this unity which is intuitively apprehended angeschaut here then we find as a fact consciousness or the general form in which being is aware of being the shape which being adopts to be identical with its self-consciousness this shape is itself a self-consciousness it is thus at the same time an existent object and this existence possesses equally directly the significance of pure thought of absolute being the absolute being existing as a concrete actual self-consciousness seems to have descended from its eternal pure simplicity but in fact it has in so doing attained for the first time its highest nature its supreme reach of being for when the notion of being has reached its simple purity of nature it is then both the absolute abstraction which is pure thought and hence the pure singleness of self and immediacy or objective being on account of its pure simplicity what is called sense consciousness is also just this pure abstraction it is this kind of thought for which being is the immediate the lowest is thus at the same time the highest the revelation which has appeared entirely on the surface is just therein the deepest that can be made that the supreme being is seen heard etc as an existent self-consciousness this is in very truth the culmination and consummation of its notion and through this consummation the divine being is given to sense exists immediately in its character as divine being this immediate existence is at the same time not solely and simply immediate consciousness it is religious consciousness this immediacy means not only an existent self-consciousness but also the purely thought constituted or absolute being and these meanings are inseparable what we the philosophers are conscious of in our conception that objective being is ultimate essence is the same as what the religious consciousness is aware of this unity of being and essence of thought which is immediately existence 
is immediate knowledge on the part of this religious consciousness just as it is the inner thought or the mediated reflective knowledge of this consciousness for this unity of being and thought is self-consciousness and actually exists in other words the thought constituted unity has at the same time this concrete shape and form of what it is god then is here revealed as he is he actually exists as he is in himself he is real as spirit god is attainable in pure speculative knowledge alone and only is in that knowledge and is merely that knowledge itself for he is spirit and this speculative knowledge is the knowledge furnished by revealed religion that knowledge knows god to be thought or pure essence and knows this thought as actual being and as real existence and existence as the negativity the reflection of itself hence as self a particular this and a universal self it is just this that revealed religion knows the hopes and expectations of preceding ages pressed forward to and were solely directed towards this revelation the vision of what absolute being is and the discovery of themselves therein this joy the joy of seeing itself an absolute being becomes realized in self-consciousness and seizes the whole world for the absolute is spirit it is the simple movement of those pure abstract moments which expresses just this that ultimate reality is then eo ipso known as spirit when it is seen and beheld as immediate self-consciousness this conception of spirit knowing itself to be spirit is still the immediate notion it is not yet developed the ultimate being is spirit in other words it has appeared it is revealed this first revelation is itself immediate but the immediacy is likewise thought or pure mediation and must therefore exhibit and set forth this moment in the sphere of immediacy as such looking at this more precisely spirit when self-consciousness is immediate is a particular this it is an individual self-consciousness set up in contrast to the universal self-consciousness it is a one a repelling and excluding unit which appears to that consciousness for which it exists in the impervious form of a sensuous other an unreduced opposite in the sphere of sense this other does not yet know spirit to be its own in other words spirit in its form as an individual self does not yet exist as equally universal self as all self or again the shape it assumes has not as yet the form of the notion that is of the universal self of the self which in its immediate actual reality is at once transcended is thought universality without losing its reality in this universality the preliminary and similarly immediate form of this universality is however not at once the form of thought itself of the notion as notion it is the universality of actual reality it is the allness the collective totality of the selves and is the elevation of existence into the sphere of presentative or figurative thought Vorstellung. just as in general to take a concrete example the this of sense when transcended is first of all the thing of perception and is not yet the universal of understanding this individual human being then which absolute being is revealed to be goes through in its own case as an individual the process found in sense existence he is the immediately present god in consequence his being passes over into his having been consciousness for which god is thus sensuously present ceases to see him to hear him it has seen him it has heard him and it is by the mere fact that it has seen and heard him that it first becomes itself spiritual consciousness or in other words he has now arisen in the life of spirit as he formerly rose before consciousness as an object existing in the sphere of sense for a consciousness which sees and hears him by sense is one which is itself merely an immediate consciousness 
which has not cancelled and transcended the disparateness of objectivity has not withdrawn it into pure thought but accepts this objectively presented individual and not itself as spirit in the disappearance of the immediate existence of what is known to be absolute being immediacy preserves its negative moment spirit remains the immediate self of actual reality but in the form of the universal self-consciousness of a religious communion a self-consciousness which rests in its own proper substance just as in it this substance is universal subject it is not the individual subject by himself but the individual along with the consciousness of the communion and what he is for this communion is the complete whole of the individual spirit the terms past and distance are however merely the imperfect form in which the immediateness gets mediated or made universal this is merely dipped superficially in the element of thought is kept there as a sensuous mode of immediacy and not made one with the nature of thought itself it is lifted out of sense merely into the region of ideation of pictorial presentation for this is the synthetic external connection of sensuous immediacy and its universality or thought End of section 27. Section 28 of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Blackbaby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 7c, Revealed Religion, Part 2. Imaginative presentation constitutes the characteristic form in which spirit is conscious of itself in this religious communion this form is not yet the self-consciousness of spirit which has reached its notion as notion the mediating process is still incomplete in this connection of being and thought then there is a defect spiritual life is still cumbered with an unreconciled diremption into a hither and a yonder a here and a beyond the content is the true content but all its moments when placed in the element of mere presentation have the character not of being conceptually comprehended but of appearing as completely independent aspects externally related to one another in order that the true content may also preserve its true form when before consciousness the latter must necessarily pass to a higher plane of mental development where the absolute substance is not intuitively apprehended but conceptually comprehended and where consciousness is for itself brought to the level of its self-consciousness in the way this has already taken place objectively or for us who have analyzed the process of experience we have to consider this content as it exists in its consciousness absolute spirit is content that is how it exists in the form of its truth but its truth consists not merely in being the substance or the inherent reality of the religious communion nor again in coming out of this inwardness into the objectivity of perceptual and presentational thought but in becoming concrete actual self reflecting itself into self and being subject this then is the process which spirit realizes in its communion this is its life what this self-revealing spirit is in and by itself is therefore not brought out by the rich and full content of its life being so to say untwined and reduced to its original and primitive strands to the ideas for instance presented before the minds of the first imperfect religious communion or even to what the actual human being incarnating the divine spirit has spoken this reversion to the primitive and elementary is based on the instinct to get at the notion and ultimate principle but it confuses the origin in the sense of the immediate existence of the first historical appearance with the pure simplicity of the notion by thus impoverishing the life of spirit by clearing away the idea of the communion and its action with regard to its idea there arises therefore not the notion but bare externality and particularity merely the historical manner in which spirit once upon a time appeared the soulless recollection of an ideally presented historical figure and its past 
spirit is content of its consciousness to begin with in the form of pure substance in other words it is content of its pure consciousness this element of thought is the process of descending into existence the sphere of particularity the middle term between these two is their synthetic connection the consciousness of passing into otherness the process of ideal presentation as such the third stage is the return from representation in idea and from that otherness in other words it is the element of self-consciousness itself these three movements constitutes the life of spirit its resolution into separate parts when it enters the form of presentation consists in its taking on a determinate mode of being this determinateness however is nothing but one of its moments its detailed process thus consists in spreading its nature over its various moments entering every one each being an element in its composition and since each of these spheres is self-complete this reflection into itself is at the same time the transition into another sphere of its being ideal presentation constitutes the middle term between pure thought and self-consciousness as such and is merely one of the determinate forms at the same time however as has been shown the character belonging to such presentation that of being synthetic connection is spread over all these elements and is their common characteristic the content itself which we have to consider has partly been met with already as the idea or presentation of the unhappy and the believing types of consciousness in the case of the unhappy despairing consciousness however the peculiarity lies in the content being produced from consciousness and longingly desired wherein the spirit can never be satiated nor find rest because the content is not yet its own content inherently and essentially or in the sense of being its substance in the case of the believing consciousness again this content has been regarded as the impersonal being of the world as the essentially objective content of presentative thought a pictorial thinking that seeks to escape the actual world altogether and consequently has not the certainty of self-consciousness a certainty which is cut off from it partly as being conceit of knowledge partly as being pure insight the consciousness of the religious communion on the other hand possesses the content as its substance just as the content is the certainty the communion has of its own spiritual life spirit represented at first as substance in the element of pure thought is thus primarily the eternal being simple self-identical which does not however have this abstract meaning of being but the meaning of absolute spirit yet spirit consists not in being a meaning not in being the inner but in being the actual the real simple eternal being would therefore be spirit merely in empty phrase if it stopped at ideational pictorial thought and went no further than the expression of simple eternal being simple being however because it is abstraction is in point of fact the inherently negative is indeed the negativity of reflective thought or negativity as found in being per se that is it is absolute distinction from itself its pure process of becoming its other qua essential being it is merely in itself purely implicit or for us but since this purity of form is just abstraction or negativity it is for itself it is the self the notion it is thus objective and since presentational thinking apprehends and expresses as an event what has just been expressed as the necessity of the notion it will be said that the eternal being produces for itself an other but in this otherness it has likewise ipso facto returned into itself again for the distinction is distinction in itself that is the distinction is directly distinguished merely from itself and is thus the unity returned into itself there are thus three moments to be distinguished imminent absolute being explicit self-existence which is the antithesis the express otherness of being and for which that being is object and self-existence or self-knowledge in that other in that antithetic expression the absolute being beholds only itself in its self-existence in its objective otherness in thus emptying itself in this kenosis it is merely within itself 
the independent self-existence which excludes itself from absolute being is the knowledge of itself on the part of absolute being it is the word the logos which when spoken empties the speaker of himself outwardizes him and leaves him behind emptied but is at the same time immediately heard and understood and only this act of hearing or perceiving himself is the actual existence of the word hence then the distinctions which are set up are immediately resolved just as they are made and are directly made just as they are resolved and the truth and the reality consist precisely in this self-closed circular process this movement within itself is what the absolute being qua spirit expresses absolute being when not grasped as spirit is merely an empty abstraction just as spirit which is not grasped as a process in this way is merely an empty word since its moments are taken purely as moments they are notions in restless activity which are merely in being inherently their own opposite and in finding their rest in the whole but the presentative pictorial thought of the religious communion is not this conceptual thinking it has the content without its necessity and instead of the form of the notion it brings into the realm of pure consciousness the natural relations of father and son since it thus even when thinking proceeds by way of figurative ideas absolute being is indeed revealed to it but the moments of this being owing to this externally synthetic presentational thinking fall of themselves apart from one another so that they are not related to each other through their own very notion while again this figurative thinking retreats from the pure object it deals with and takes up a merely external relation towards it the object is externally revealed to it from an alien source and in this thought of spirit it does not find its own self does not recognize the nature of pure self-consciousness in so far as the form of presentative thinking and that way of thinking by means of relationships derived from nature have to be transcended and especially the methods of taking the moments of the process in which the life of spirit consists as isolated fixed immovable substances or subjects instead of transient moments this transcendence is to be looked at as a compulsion on the part of the notion in the way we formerly pointed out when dealing with another aspect but since it is only an instinct it mistakes its own real character rejects the content along with the form and what comes to the same thing degrades the content into a historical imaginative idea and an heirloom handed down by tradition in this way there is retained and preserved only what is purely external to the sphere of belief and hence a lifeless entity devoid of knowledge while the inner element in belief has passed away because this would be the notion knowing itself as notion the absolute spirit ideally presented in pure ultimate being is indeed not the abstract pure being rather just by the fact that this is merely a moment in the life of spirit it is lowered to the level of constituent element the representation of spirit in this element however has inherently the same defect as regards form which ultimate being as such has ultimate being is abstraction and therefore the negative of its simplicity is an other in the same way spirit in the element of ultimate being is the form of simple unity which on that account is essentially and at the same time a process of turning to otherness or what is the same thing the relation of the eternal being to its self-existence its objective existence for itself is that of pure thought a directly simple relation in this simple beholding of itself in the other otherness is not as such set up independently it is distinction in the way distinction in pure thought is immediately no distinction a recognition of love where lover and beloved are not in their very being opposed to each other at all spirit which is expressed in the element of pure thought is essentially just this not to be merely in that element but to be concrete actual for otherness that is cancelling and superseding pure conception thought constituted conception lies in the very notion of spirit the element of pure thought because it is an abstract element 
is itself rather the other of its own simplicity and hence passes over into ideal presentation proper the element where the moments of the pure notion at once preserve a substantial existence in opposition to each other and are subjects as well which do not exist for a third thing in indifference towards each other but being reflected into themselves break away from one another and stand confronting each other merely eternal or abstract spirit then becomes an other to itself it enters existence and in the first instance enters immediate existence it creates a world this creation is the word which pictorial presentative thought uses to convey the absolute movement which the notion itself goes through or to express the fact that the absolutely simple or pure thought because it is abstract thought is really the negative and hence opposed to itself the other of itself or because to state the same in another way what is put forward as ultimate being is simple immediacy bare objective existence but qua immediacy or existence is without self and lacking thus inwardness is passive or has a relative existence exists for another this relative existence is at the same time a world spirit in the character of existing for another is the undisturbed separate subsistence of those moments formerly enclosed within pure thought is therefore the dissolution of their simple universality and their dispersion into their own particularity the world however is not merely spirit thus thrown out and scattered in all its plenitude with an external order imposed on it for since spirit is essentially simple self this self is likewise present therein it is objectively existent spirit which is individual self that has consciousness and distinguishes itself as other as world from itself in the way this individual self is thus immediately established at first it is not yet conscious of being spirit it thus does not exist as spirit it may be called innocent but not strictly good in order that in fact it may be self and spirit it has first to become objectively an other to itself in the same way that the eternal being manifests itself as the process of being self-identical in its otherness since this spirit is determined as only immediately existing or dispersed in the diverse multiplicity of its conscious life its becoming other means that knowledge is centred on itself concentrates itself upon its subjective content immediate existence turns into thought or merely sense consciousness turns round into consciousness of thought and moreover because that thought has come from immediacy or is conditioned thought it is not pure knowledge but thought which contains otherness and is thus the self-opposed thought of good and evil man is pictorially represented by the religious mind in this way it happened once as an event with no necessity about it that he lost the form of harmonious unity with himself by plucking the fruits of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and was driven from the state of conscious innocence from paradise from the garden with all its creatures and from nature offering its bounties without man's toil since this self-centredness on the part of the existent consciousness directly gives rise to disharmony with itself evil appears as the first actual expression of the self-centred consciousness and because the thoughts of good and evil are utterly opposed and this opposition is not yet broken down this consciousness is essentially and merely evil at the same time however owing to just this very opposition there is present also the good consciousness opposing the one that is evil and again their relation to each other in so far as immediate existence turns round into thought and self-absorption self-centredness is just thought while again the transition to otherness on the part of being is thereby more precisely determined the fact of becoming evil can be removed further backwards away out of the actually existing world and transferred to the very earliest realm of thought it may thus be said that it was the very first-born son of light lucifer who by becoming self-centred fell 
but that in his place another was at once created such a form of expression as fallen belonging merely to figurative thought and not to the notion just like the term sun once more transmutes and lowers the moments of the notion to the level of imaginative thought or in other words drags pictures and presentations into the realm of thought in the same way it is matter of indifference to coordinate a multiplicity of other angelic shapes and forms with the simple thought of otherness in the being of the eternal and transfer to them that condition of self-centredness this coordination must all the same win approval for the reason that through it this moment of otherness does express diversity as it should do not indeed as plurality in general but as determinate diversity so that one part is the sun that which is simple and knows itself to be ultimate being while the other part involves the abandonment the emptying of self-existence and merely lives to praise that being to this part may then also be assigned the resumption once again of the self-existence relinquished and that self-centredness characteristic of evil in so far as this condition of otherness falls into two parts spirit might as regards its moments be more exactly expressed numerically as a quaternity a four in one or because the multiplicity breaks up itself again into two parts that is one part which has remained good the other which has become evil might be expressed as a quinity counting the moments however can be regarded as altogether useless since for one thing what is distinguished is itself just as truly one and single that is the thought of distinction which is only one thought as the thoughts is this element distinguished the second over against the first for another thing it is useless to count because the thought which grasps the many in one has to be dissolved out of its universality and must be distinguished into more than three or four distinct components this universality appears in contrast to the absolute determinateness of the abstract unit the principle of number as indeterminateness in relation to number as such so that we can only speak in this connection of numbers in general that is not of a specific number of distinctions hence in general it is here quite superfluous to think of number and counting just as in other connections the bare difference of magnitude and multitude says nothing at all and falls outside conceptual thought good and evil were the specific distinctions of thought which we found since their opposition is not yet broken down and they are represented as essential realities of thought each of them independent by itself man is the self with no essential reality of his own and the mere ground which keeps them together and on which they exist and war with one another but these universal powers of good and evil belong all the same to the self or the self is their actualizing principle from this point of view it thus comes about that as evil is nothing else than the natural existence of spirit becoming self-absorbed and self-centred conversely good enters into actual reality and appears as an objectively existing self-consciousness the idea of the transition of the divine being into otherness is in general merely indicated and hinted at when spirit is interpreted in terms of pure thoughts for figurative thinking this idea here comes nearer its realization the realization is taken to consist in the divine being humbling itself and renouncing its abstract nature and unreality the other aspect that of evil is taken by imagination as an event extraneous and alien to the divine being to grasp evil in the divine being as the wrath of god that is the supreme effort the severest strain of which figurative thought wrestling with its own limitations is capable an effort which since it dispenses with the notion remains a fruitless struggle the alienation of the divine nature is thus set up in its double-sided form the self of spirit and its simple thought are the two moments whose absolute unity is spirit itself its alienation with itself consists in the two falling apart from each other and in the one having an unequal value as against the other 
this disparateness is therefore twofold in character and two connections arise which have in common the moments just given in the one the divine being stands for what is essential while natural existence and the self are unessential and are to be cancelled in the other on the contrary it is self-existence which passes for what is essential and the divine pure and simple for unessential their mediating though empty ground is existence in general the bare community of their two moments the dissolution of this opposition does not take effect through the struggle between the two elements which are represented as separate and independent beings just in virtue of their independence each must inherently through its own notion dissolve itself in itself the struggle takes place first in that quarter where both cease to be this mixture of thought and independent existence and confront each other merely as thoughts for in that case being determinate notions they essentially exist merely in the relation of opposition qua independent on the other hand they have their essential nature outside opposition their movement is thus free self-determined and peculiar to themselves just as this movement then of both is inherently movement because it has to be regarded in themselves it is set going only by that element of the two which has the character of being inherently essential as contrasted with the other this is represented as a spontaneous action but the necessity for its self-abandonment lies in the notion that what is inherently essential and gets this specific character merely through opposition has just on that account no real independent subsistence therefore that element which has for its essence not independent self-existence but simple being is what empties and abandons itself gives itself unto death and so reconciles absolute being with its own self for in this process it manifests itself as spirit the abstract being is estranged from itself it has natural existence and actual individual reality this its otherness or its being sensuously present is taken back again by the second process of self-abandonment of becoming other and is affirmed as superseded as universal thereby the divine being has come to itself in the sphere of the sensuous present the immediate existence of actual reality has ceased to be something alien or external to the divine by being sublated by its becoming universal this death of immediacy is therefore its rising anew as spirit when the self-conscious being cancels and transcends its immediate present it is universal self-consciousness this notion of the transcended individual self which is absolute being immediately expresses therefore the establishment of a communion which while hitherto having its abode in the sphere of pictorial presentation now returns into itself as the self and spirit thus passes from the second element constituting it figurative presentation and goes over to the third self-consciousness as such if we further consider the kind of procedure that presentative thinking adopts as it goes along we find in the first place the expression that the divine being puts on human nature here it is eo ipso asserted that implicitly and inherently the two are not separate just as in the statement that the divine being from the beginning empties itself of itself that its objective existence is self-absorbed centres in itself and becomes evil it is not asserted but implied that per se this evil existence is not something alien to the divine nature absolute being would be merely an empty name if in very truth there were any other being external to it if there were an absolute fall from it the aspect of self-centeredness self-absorption really constitutes the essential moment of the self of spirit that this self-centeredness whence primarily comes its reality belongs to the divine being while this is for us a notion and so as far as it is a notion appears to the presentative thinking as an inconceivable historical fact 
the inherent and essential nature assumes for figurative thought the form of a bare objective fact external and indifferent to god the thought however that those apparently mutually repugnant moments absolute being and self-existent self are not inseparable comes also before this figurative way of thinking since it does possess the real content but that thought appears afterwards in the form that the divine being empties itself of itself and is made flesh this figurative idea which in this way is still immediate and hence not spiritual that is it takes the human form assumed by the divine to be merely in the first instance a particular form not yet a universal form becomes spiritual for this consciousness in the process whereby god who has assumed shape and form surrenders again his external his immediate existence and returns to his inner being the divine being is then spirit when it is reflected into itself the reconciliation of the divine being with its antithesis as a whole and specifically with the thought of this other evil is thus presented here in a figurative way when this reconciliation is expressed conceptually by saying it consists in the fact that evil is inherently the same as what goodness is or again that the divine being is the same as nature in its entire extent just as nature separated from god is simply nothingness then this must be looked at as an unspiritual mode of expression which is bound to give rise to misunderstandings when evil is the same as goodness then evil is just not evil nor goodness good on the contrary both are really done away with evil in general self-centred self-existence and goodness selfless simple abstraction since in this way they are both expressed in terms of their notion the unity of the two is at once apparent for self-centred self-existence is simple knowledge and what is selfless simple abstraction is as much pure self-existence centred within itself hence if it must be said that good and evil in their conception that is so far as they are not good and evil are the same just as certainly it must be said that they are not the same but absolutely different for simple self-existence or again pure knowledge is equally pure negativity or per se absolute distinction it is only these two propositions that make the whole complete and when the first is asserted and asseverated it must be met and opposed by insisting on the other with immovable obstinacy since both are equally right they are both equally wrong and their wrong consists in taking such abstract forms as the same and not the same identity and non-identity to be something true fixed real and in resting on them neither the one nor the other has truth their truth is just their movement the process in which simple sameness is abstraction and thus absolute distinction while this again being distinction per se is distinguished from itself and so is self-identity precisely this is what we have in the case of the sameness of the divine being and nature in general and human nature in particular the former is nature so far as it is not essentially being nature is divine in its essential being but it is in spirit that we find both abstract aspects affirmed as they truly are that is as cancelled and preserved at once and this way of affirming them cannot be expressed by the judgment by the soulless word is the copula of the judgment in the same way nature is nothing outside its essential being god but this nothing itself is all the same it is absolute abstraction pure thought or self-centredness and with its moment of opposition to spiritual unity it is the principle of evil the difficulty people find in these conceptions is due solely to sticking to the term is and forgetting the character of thought where the moments as much are as they are not are the process which is spirit it is this spiritual unity unity where the distinctions are merely in the form of moments or are transcended and maintained which became known to presentative thinking in that atoning reconciliation spoken of above 
and since this unity is the universality of self-consciousness self-consciousness has ceased to be figurative or pictorial in its thinking the process has turned back into it spirit thus takes up its position in the third element in universal self-consciousness spirit is its own community the movement of this community being that of self-consciousness which distinguishes itself from its figurative idea consists in explicitly bringing out what has implicitly become established the dead divine man or human god is implicitly universal self-consciousness he has to become explicitly so for this self-consciousness or since this self-consciousness constitutes one side of the opposition involved in ideal presentation that is the side of evil which takes natural existence and individual self-existence to be the essential reality this aspect which is presented as independent and not yet as a moment has on account of its independence to raise itself in and for itself to the level of spirit it has to reveal the process of spirit in this aspect this particular self-consciousness is spirit in natural form natural spirit self has to withdraw from this natural existence and enter into itself become self-centred that means it has to become evil but this aspect is already per se evil entering into itself consists therefore in persuading itself that natural thinking is what is evil by presentational picture thinking the world is supposed actually to become evil and be evil as an actual fact and the atoning reconcilement of the absolute being is viewed as an actual existent phenomenon by self-consciousness as such however this figurative presentation of the truth as regards its form is considered to be merely a moment that is already superseded and transcended for the self is the principle of negation and hence knowledge a knowledge which is a pure act of consciousness within itself this moment of the negative must in like manner find expression as regards the content since that is to say the absolute being is inherently and from the start reconciled with itself and is a spiritual unity in which the parts constituting the presentation are sublated are moments what we find is that each element of the presentation receives here the opposite significance to that which it had before by this means each meaning finds its completion in the other and the content is then and thereby a spiritual content since the specific determinateness of each is just as much its opposite unity in otherness spiritual reality is achieved and completed just as formerly we saw opposite meanings combined and united objectively or in themselves and even the abstract forms of the same and not the same identity and non-identity cancelled one another and were transcended if then from the point of view of figurative thought the natural self-consciousness rooted and fixed in itself was the real evil that process of becoming fixed in itself is in the sphere of self-consciousness the knowledge of evil as something that per se belongs to existence this knowledge is certainly a process of becoming evil but merely of the thought of evil and is therefore recognized as the first moment of reconciliation for being a return into self out of the immediacy of nature which is specifically the principle of evil it is a forsaking of that immediacy and a dying to sin it is not natural existence as such that consciousness forsakes but natural existence that is at the same time known to be evil the immediate process of fixing itself within itself of becoming self-centred is just as much immediate process it presupposes itself that is is its own ground and principle the reason for fixing itself in self is because nature has per se already done so on account of evil man must be turned back into himself but evil is itself the process of doing so of fixing himself in self this first movement is just on that account itself merely immediate is its bare and simple notion because it is the same as what its ground or reason is 
the movement or the process of passing into otherness must therefore come out afterwards in its own more peculiar form beside this immediacy then the mediation of ideal presentation is necessary implicitly and essentially the knowledge of nature as the untrue inadequate expression of spirit's existence and this universality of self which has thereby arisen within the life of the self these constitute the reconciliation of spirit with itself this implicit state is apprehended by the self-consciousness that does not think conceptually in the form of an objective existence and as something presented to it figuratively conceptual comprehension begreifen therefore does not mean for it a grasping ergreifen of this conception begrif which knows natural existence when cancelled and transcended to be universal and thus reconciled with itself but rather a laying hold of that ideal presentation the imaginative idea vorstellung that the divine being is reconciled with its existence through an event the event of god's emptying himself of himself relinquishing his divine being through his factual incarnation and his death the laying hold of this idea now expresses more specifically what was formerly called in figurative thinking spiritual resurrection or the process by which god's individual self-consciousness becomes the universal becomes the religious communion the death of the divine man qua death is abstract negativity the immediate result of the process which terminates only in the universality belonging to nature in spiritual self-consciousness death loses its natural significance it passes into its true principle or conception the conception just mentioned death then ceases to signify what it means directly the non-existence of this particular individual and becomes transformed and transfigured into the universality of spirit which lives in its own communion dies there daily and daily rises again that which belongs to the sphere of pictorial thought that is that absolute spirit qua individual or rather qua particular embodies and presents in its objective existence the nature of spirit is thus here transferred to self-consciousness itself to the sphere where knowledge maintains itself in its otherness in its opposite this self-consciousness does not therefore really die as the particular person is represented to have really died its particularity succumbs and expires in its universality that is in its knowledge which is true being reconciling itself with itself that primary and prior element of presentative thinking is thus here set forth as transcendent as in other words returned into the self into its notion what was in the former merely an existent entity has come to assume the form of subject by that very fact the first element too pure thought and the spirit eternal therein are no longer away beyond and outside the mind thinking pictorially nor beyond the self rather the return of the whole into itself consists just in containing all moments within itself when the death of the mediator is laid hold of by the self brought within its grasp this means the sublation and transcendence of his factuality of his particular independent existence this particular self-existence has become universal self-consciousness on the other side the universal just because of this is self-consciousness and the pure or abstract unreal spirit of bare thought has become concrete and actual the death of the mediator is death not merely of his natural aspect of his particular self-existence what dies is not merely the outer encasement which being stripped of true being is eo ipso dead but also the abstraction of the divine being for the mediator as long as his death has not yet accomplished the reconciliation is something one-sided which takes as true being the simple abstract element of thought not concrete reality this one-sided extreme of self has not yet equal worth and value with ultimate being the self first gets this as spirit when the mediator as imaginatively presented dies 
his death implies at the same time the death of the mere abstraction of divine being which is not yet affirmed as a self that death is the bitterness and pain of the unhappy consciousness when it feels that god himself is dead this harsh utterance is the expression of inmost self-knowledge which has self bare and simple for its content it is the return of the consciousness into the depth of darkness where ego is nothing but bare identity of ego a darkness distinguishing and knowing nothing more outside it this feeling thus means in point of fact the loss of the substance and of its objective existence over against consciousness but at the same time it is the pure subjectivity of substance the pure certainty and inner assurance of itself which it lacked when it was object or immediacy pure ultimate being this knowledge is thus the process of spiritualization whereby substance becomes subject by which its abstraction and lifelessness have expired and substance therefore has become concrete and real simple universal self-consciousness in this way then spirit is spirit knowing its own self it knows itself that which is for it object exists or in other words its objectively presented idea is the true absolute content as we saw the content expresses just spirit itself it is at the same time not merely content of self-consciousness and not merely object for self-consciousness it is also concrete actual spirit it is this by the fact of its passing through and realizing the three elements of its nature this movement through the content of its whole self in this way constitutes its actual reality what moves itself that is spirit it is the subject of the movement and it is likewise the moving process itself or the substance through which the subject makes its way we saw how the notion of spirit arose when we entered the sphere of religion it was the process of self-assured spirit which forgives and pardons evil and in so doing puts aside its own simplicity of nature and rigid unchangeableness it was to state it otherwise the process in which what is absolutely in opposition recognizes itself as the same as its opposite and this knowledge breaks out into the yea yea with which one extreme meets the other the religious consciousness to which the absolute being is revealed sees this notion and does away with the distinction of its self from what it beholds and as it is subject so it is also substance and is thus itself spirit just because and in so far as it is this process this religious communion however has not yet achieved its complete self-consciousness its content in general is put before it in the form of an objective pictorial idea so that this disruption or opposition still attaches even to the actual spiritual character of the communion to its return out of its presentative way of thinking just as the element of pure thought itself was also hampered with that opposition this spiritual communion too is not aware what it is it is spiritual self-consciousness which is not object to itself in this form or does not develop into clear consciousness of itself rather so far as it is consciousness it has before it ideal presentations those picture thoughts which were considered we see self-consciousness at its last turning point become inward to itself and attain to knowledge of its inner being of its self-centeredness we see it relinquish and empty itself of its natural existence and reach pure negativity but the positive significance that is that this negativity or pure inwardness of knowledge is just as much the self-identical absolute being put otherwise that substance has here attained to being absolute self-consciousness this is for the devotional consciousness an objective other something external it grasps this aspect that the knowledge which becomes purely inward is inherently absolute simplicity or substance as the idea of something which is not thus by its very conception but as the act of satisfaction obtained from an other 
in other words it is not really aware as a fact that this depth of pure self is the power by which the abstract ultimate being is drawn down from its abstractness and raised to the level of self by the strength and force of this pure devotion the action of the self hence retains towards it this negative significance because the relinquishment of itself on the part of substance is for the self an ultimate reality something per se the self does not at once grasp and comprehend it or does not find it in its own action as such since this unity of ultimate being and self has been essentially and inherently brought about consciousness too has this idea of its reconciliation but in the form of an imaginative idea it obtains satisfaction by attaching in an external way to its pure negativity the positive significance of the unity of itself with absolute being its satisfaction thus itself remains hampered with the opposition of an external beyond its own peculiar reconciliation therefore enters its consciousness as something remote something far away in the future just as the reconciliation which the other self achieved appears as a way in the distance of the past just as the individual god-man has an implicit a potential father and only an actual mother in like manner we may say the universal god-man the spiritual communion has as its father its own proper action and knowledge while its mother is eternal love which it merely feels but does not behold as an actual immediate object present in its consciousness its reconciliation therefore is in its heart but still with its conscious life sundered in twain and its actual reality shattered what falls within its consciousness as the inherent and essential element the aspect of pure mediation is the reconciliation that lies beyond while what appears as actually present in its consciousness as the aspect of immediacy and of existence is the world which has yet to await transfiguration the world is no doubt implicitly reconciled with the divine being and that being no doubt knows that it no longer regards the object as alienated from itself but as one with itself in its love but for self-consciousness this immediate presence has not yet the form and shape of spiritual reality thus the spirit of the communion is in its immediate consciousness separated from its religious consciousness which declares indeed that these two modes of consciousness implicitly and inherently are not separated but this is an implicitness which is not realized or has not yet become an absolute explicit self-existence as well end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter eight absolute knowledge the spirit manifested in revealed religion has not as yet surmounted its attitude of consciousness as such or what is the same thing its concrete self-consciousness is not at this stage the object it is aware of spirit as a whole and the moments distinguished in it fall within the sphere of presentative thinking or presentations with the form of objectivity the content of this presentational thought is absolute spirit all that remains to be done now is to cancel and transcend this bare form or better because the form appertains to consciousness as such its true meaning must have come out in the shapes and modes consciousness has already assumed the surmounting of the object of consciousness in this way is not to be taken one-sidedly as meaning that the object shows itself returning into the self it has a more definite and specific meaning it means that the object as such presents itself to the self as a vanishing factor and furthermore that the emptying the relinquishment of self-consciousness itself establishes thinghood and that this laying aside of self-consciousness has not merely negative but positive significance a significance not merely for us or per se but for self-consciousness itself 
the negative of the object its cancelling its own existence gets for self-consciousness a positive significance or self-consciousness knows this nothingness of the object because on the one hand self-consciousness itself relinquishes itself for in doing so it establishes itself as object or by reason of the indivisible unity characterizing its self-existence sets up the object as its self on the other hand there is also this other moment in the process that self-consciousness has just as really cancelled and done away with this self-relinquishment and objectification and has resumed them into itself and is thus at home with itself in its otherness this is the movement of consciousness and in this process consciousness is the totality of its moments consciousness at the same time had to take up a relation to the object in all its aspects and phases and grasp its meaning from the point of view of each of them this totality of its determinate characteristics makes the object per se and inherently a spiritual reality and it becomes so in truth for consciousness when the latter apprehends every individual one of them as self that is when it takes up towards them the spiritual relationship just spoken of the object is then partly immediate existence a thing in general corresponding to immediate consciousness partly an alteration of itself its relatedness or existence for another and existence for self determinateness corresponding to perception partly essential being or in the form of a universal corresponding to intelligence or understanding the object as a whole is the mediated result the conclusion or the passing of universality into individuality through specification as also the reverse process from individual to universal through cancelled individuality or specific determination these three specific aspects then determine the ways in which consciousness must get to know the object in the form of self this knowledge of which we are speaking is however not knowledge in the sense of pure conceptual comprehension of the object here this knowledge is to be taken as a developing process has to be taken in its various moments and set forth in the manner appropriate to consciousness as such and the moments of the notion proper of pure and absolute knowledge are to assume the form of modes or attitudes of consciousness for that reason the object does not yet when present in consciousness as such appear as the inner essence of spirit in the way this has just been expressed the procedure consciousness adopts in regard to the object is not that of considering it either in this totality as such or in the pure conceptual form it is partly that of a mode or attitude of consciousness in general partly a multitude of such modes which we who analyze the process gather together and in which the totality of the moments of the object and of the procedure of consciousness can be shown merely resolved into their separate elements to understand this method of grasping the object where apprehension is a form or mode of consciousness we have here only to recall the previous form of consciousness which came before us earlier in the argument as regards the object then so far as it is immediate an indifferent objective entity we saw reason at the stage of observation seeking and finding itself in this indifferent thing that is we saw it conscious that its activity is there of an external sort and at the same time conscious of the object merely as an immediate object we saw too its specific character take expression at its highest stage in the infinite judgment the being of the ego is a thing and further the ego is an immediate thing of sense when ego is called a soul it is indeed represented also as a thing but a thing in the sense of something invisible impalpable etc that is in fact not as an immediate entity and not as that which is generally understood by a thing that judgment then ego is a thing taken at first glance has no spiritual content or rather is just the absence of spirituality in its conception however it is in fact the most luminous and illuminating judgment and this its inner significance which is not yet made evident is what the two other moments to be considered express 
the thing is ego in point of fact thing is transcended in this infinite judgment the thing is nothing in itself it only has significance in a relation only through the ego and its reference to the ego this moment came before consciousness in pure insight and enlightenment things are simply and solely useful profitable and only to be considered from the point of view of their utility the trained and cultivated self-consciousness which has traversed the region of spirit in self-alienation has by giving up itself produced the thing as its self it retains itself therefore still in the thing and knows the thing to have no independence in other words knows that the thing has essentially and solely a relative existence or again to give complete expression to the relationship that is to what here alone constitutes the nature of the object the thing stands for something that is self-existent sense certainty sense experience is announced as absolute truth but this self-existence is itself declared to be a moment which merely disappears and passes into its opposite into a being at the mercy of an other but knowledge of the thing is not yet finished at this point the thing must become known as self not merely in regard to the immediateness of its being and as regards specific determinateness but also in the sense of essence or inner reality this is found in the case of moral self-consciousness this mode of experience thinks of its knowledge as the absolute essential element knows no other objective being than pure will or pure knowledge it is nothing but merely this will and this knowledge any other possesses merely non-essential being that is being that has no inherent nature per se but only its empty husk in so far as the moral consciousness in its view of the world lets existence drop out of the self it just as truly reclaims and takes this existence back again into the self in the form of conscience finally it is no longer this incessant alternation between the placing and the displacing dissembling of existence and self it knows that its existence as such is this pure certainty of its own self the objective element into which qua acting it puts forth itself is nothing else than pure knowledge of itself by itself these are the moments which compose the reconciliation of spirit with its own consciousness proper by themselves they are particular and separate and it is their spiritual unity alone which furnishes the power for this reconciliation the last of these moments is however necessarily this unity itself and as we see binds them all in fact into itself spirit certain of itself in its objective existence takes as the element of its existence nothing else than this knowledge of self the declaration that what it does it does in accordance with the convictions of duty this statement is the warrant for its own action and makes good its conduct action is the first inherent division of the simple unity of the notion and the return out of this division this first movement turns round into the second since the element of recognition is put forward as simple knowledge of duty in contrast to the distinction and diremption that lie in action as such and in this way form a rigid reality confronting action in pardon however we saw how this rigid fixity gave way and renounced its claims reality has here qua immediate existence no other significance for self-consciousness than that of being pure knowledge similarly qua determinate existence or qua relation what is self-opposed is a knowledge partly of this purely individual self partly of knowledge qua universal herein it is established at the same time that the third moment universality or the essence means for each of the two opposite factors merely knowledge finally they also cancel the empty opposition that still remains and are the knowledge of ego as identical with ego this individual self which is immediately pure knowledge or universal this reconciliation of consciousness with self-consciousness thus proves to be brought about in a double-sided way in the one case in the religious mind 
in the other case in consciousness itself as such they are distinguished inter se by the fact that the one is this reconciliation in the form of implicit immanence the other in the form of explicit self-existence as we have considered them they at the beginning fall apart in the order in which the modes or types of consciousness came before us consciousness has reached the individual moments of that order and also their unification long before ever religion gave its object the shape and mould of actual self-consciousness the unification of both aspects is not yet brought to light it is this that winds up this series of embodiments of spiritual life for in it spirit gets to the point where it knows itself not only as it is inherently in itself or in terms of its absolute content nor only as it is objectively for itself in terms of its bare form devoid of content or in terms of self-consciousness but as it is in its self-completeness as it is inherently and explicitly in itself and for itself this unification has however already taken place by implication and has done so in religion in the return of the objective presentation vorstellung into self-consciousness but not according to the proper form for the religious aspect is the aspect of the essentially independent an sich, and stands in contrast to the process of self-consciousness the unification therefore belongs to this other aspect which by contrast is the aspect of reflection into self is that side which contains its self and its opposite and contains them not only implicitly an sich, or in a general way but explicitly für sich or expressly developed and distinguished the content as well as the other aspect of self-conscious spirit so far as it is the other aspect have been brought to light and are here in their completeness the unification still a wanting is the simple unity of the notion this notion is also already given with the aspect of self-consciousness but as it previously came before us above it like all the other moments has the form of being a particular mode or type of consciousness it is that part of the embodiment of self-assured spirit which keeps within its essential principle and was called the beautiful soul that is to say the beautiful soul is its own knowledge of itself in its pure transparent unity self-consciousness which knows this pure knowledge of pure inwardness to be spirit is not merely intuition of the divine but the self-intuition of god himself since this notion keeps itself fixedly opposed to its realization it is the one-sided form which we saw before disappear into thin air but also take a positive external embodiment and advance further through the process of realization this self-consciousness bereft of objective content ceases to hold fast by itself the abstract determinateness of the notion over against its fulfillment is cancelled and done away with its self-consciousness attains the form of universality and what remains is its true notion the notion that has attained its realization the notion in its truth that is in unity with its externalization it is knowledge of pure knowledge not in the sense of an abstract essence such as duty is but in the sense of an essential being which is this particular knowledge this individual pure self-consciousness which is at the same time an object for the object is the self-existing self this notion obtained its fulfilment partly from the acts performed by the spirit that is sure of itself partly from religion in the latter it obtained the absolute content qua content or in the form of an ideal presentation or of otherness for consciousness on the other hand in the first the form is just the self for that mode contains the active practical spirit sure of itself the self accomplishes the life of absolute spirit this mode as we see is that simple notion which however gives up its eternal inner being takes upon itself objective existence or acts the power of diremption or of coming forth out of its inwardness lies in the purity of the notion for this purity is absolute abstraction or negativity in the same way the notion finds its element of reality 
or the objective being it contains in pure knowledge itself for this knowledge is simple immediacy which is being and existence as well as essence the former negative thought the latter positive thought this existence finally is just as much that state of reflection into self which comes out of pure existence both qua existence and qua duty and this is the state of evil this process of going into self constitutes the opposition lying in the notion and is thus the appearance on the scene of pure knowledge of the essence a knowledge giving rise to no action and no reality but to make its appearance in this opposition is to participate in it pure knowledge of essence has inherently relinquished its simplicity for it is the diremption or negativity which constitutes a notion so far as this process of diremption is the process of becoming self-centred it is the principle of evil so far as it is the inherently essential it is the principle of constant goodness now what in the first instance takes place implicitly and inherently is at once objectively for consciousness and is duplicated as well is both for consciousness and is its self-existence or its own proper action the same thing that is already inherently established thus repeats itself now as knowledge thereof on the part of consciousness and as conscious action each finds the other lay aside the independence of character with which each appears confronting the other this waving of independence is the same renunciation of the one-sidedness of the notion as constituted implicitly the beginning but it is now its own act of renunciation just as the notion renounced its own notion that implicit nature of the beginning is in truth as much mediated because it is negativity it now establishes itself as it is in its truth and the negative element exists as a determinate quality which each has for the other and is inherently and essentially self-cancelling self-transcending the one of the two parts of the opposition is the disparity between existence within itself in its individuality and universality the other disparity between its abstract universality and the self the former lets its self-existence perish and relinquishes itself makes confession the latter renounces the rigidity of its abstract universality and thereby puts away its lifeless self and its inert universality so that the former is completed through the moment of universality which is the essence and the latter through universality which is the self by this process of action spirit has come to light in the form of pure universality of knowledge which is self-consciousness as self-consciousness which is simple unity of knowledge it is through action that spirit is spirit so as definitely to exist it raises its existence into the sphere of thought and hence into absolute opposition and returns out of it through and within this very opposition thus then what was in the case of religion objective content or a way of ideally presenting an other is here the action proper of the self the notion is the connecting principle securing that the content is the action proper of the self for this notion is as we see the knowledge that the action of the self within itself is all that is essential and all existence the knowledge of the subject as substance and of the substance as this knowledge of its action what we have done here in addition is simply to gather together the particular moments each of which in principle exhibits the life of spirit in its entirety and again to fix and secure the notion in the form of the notion whose content was disclosed in those moments and had already presented itself in the form of a mode or type of consciousness this last embodiment of spirit spirit which at once gives its complete and true content the form of self and thereby realizes its notion and in doing so remains within its own notion this is absolute knowledge it is spirit knowing itself in the form of spirit it is conceptual comprehensive knowledge through notions truth is here not merely in itself absolutely identical with certainty it has also the typical form of certainty of self or in its existence 
that is for spirit knowing it it is in the form of knowledge of itself truth is the content which in the case of religion is not as yet at one with its certainty this identification however is secured when the content has received the form and character of self by this means what constitutes the very essence that is the notion comes to have the nature of existence that is assumes the form of what is objective to consciousness spirit appearing before consciousness in this element of existence or what is here the same thing produced by it in this element is systematic science the nature moments and process of this type of knowledge have then come about in such a way that this knowledge is pure self-existence of self-consciousness it is ego which is this concrete ego and no other and at the same time from its very nature is mediated or sublated universal ego it has a content which it distinguishes from itself for it is pure negativity or self diremption it is consciousness this content in its distinction is itself the ego for it is the process of superseding itself or the same pure negativity which constitutes ego ego is in it qua distinguished reflected into itself only then is the content conceptually comprehended begriffen, when ego in its otherness is still at home with itself more precisely stated this content is nothing else than the very process just spoken of for the content is the spirit which traverses the whole range of its own being and does this for itself qua spirit by the fact that it possesses the form of the notion in its objectivity as to the actual existence of this notion science does not appear in time and in reality till spirit has arrived at this stage of being conscious regarding itself qua spirit which knows what it is it did not exist before and is not to be found at all till after the completion of the task of mastering and overcoming the imperfection of its form the task of procuring for its consciousness and making itself aware of the shape of its inmost essence and in this manner squaring its self-consciousness with its consciousness spirit in and for itself spirit in its self-contained reality is when distinguished into its separate moments self-existent knowledge conceptual comprehension in general which as such has not yet reached the substance or is not in itself absolute knowledge now in actual reality the knowing substance is arrived at earlier than its form earlier than the form of the notion for the substance is the undeveloped inherent nature the fundamental notion in its inner simplicity the state of inwardness or the self of spirit not yet objectivified what is there what does exist is in the shape of unexpressed simplicity the undeveloped immediate or the object of presentative consciousness in general because knowledge erkennen, is a spiritual state of consciousness which is only aware of what implicitly and inherently is so far as this is a being for the self and the being of the self or a notion knowledge has on this account merely a barren object to begin with in contrast to which the substance and the consciousness of this substance are richer in content revelation in such a case is in fact concealment for the substance is here still selfless existence and nothing but certainty of self is manifest or revealed to it to begin with therefore it is only the abstract moments that fold self-consciousness when dealing with the substance but since these moments are pure activities and must move forward by their very nature self-consciousness enriches itself till it has torn from consciousness the entire substance and absorbed into itself the entire structure of the substance with all its constituent elements since this negative attitude towards objectivity is positive as well establishes and fixes the content it goes on till it has produced these elements out of itself and thereby reinstated them once more as objects of consciousness in the notion knowing itself as notion the moments thus make their appearance prior to the whole in its complete fulfilment the movement of these motions is the process by which the whole comes into being in consciousness on the other hand the whole but not as comprehended conceptually is prior to the moments 
time is just the notion definitely existent and presented to consciousness in the form of empty pure intuition hence spirit necessarily appears in time and it appears in time so long as it does not grasp its pure notion that is so long as it does not annul time time is the pure self in external form apprehended in intuition and not grasped and understood by the self it is the notion directly apprehended through intuition when this notion grasps itself it supersedes the time character conceptually comprehends intuition and is intuition comprehended and comprehending through conceptions time therefore appears as spirit's destiny and necessity where spirit is not yet complete within itself it is the necessity compelling spirit to increase and enrich the share self-consciousness has in consciousness to put into motion the immediacy of the inherent nature which is the form in which the substance is present in consciousness or conversely to realize and to make manifest what is inherent regarded as inward and immanent to make manifest that which is at first within that is to vindicate and secure for it the certainty of self for this reason it must be said that nothing is consciously known which does not fall within experience or as it is also expressed which is not felt to be true which is not given as an inwardly revealed eternal verity as a sacred object of belief or whatever other expressions we care to employ for experience just consists in this that the content and the content is spirit in its inherent nature is substance and so object of consciousness but this substance in which spirit consists is the development of itself explicitly to what it is inherently and implicitly and only by this process of reflecting itself into itself is it then essentially and in truth spirit it is inherently the movement which constitutes the process of knowledge the transforming of that implicit inherent nature into explicitness and objectivity of substance into subject of the object of consciousness into the object of self-consciousness that is into an object that is at the same time superseded and transcended in other words into the notion this transforming process is a cycle that returns into itself a cycle that presupposes its beginning and reaches its beginning only at the end so far as spirit then is of necessity this process of self-distinction it appears as a single whole intuitively apprehended over against its simple self-consciousness and since that whole is the aspect distinguished it is distinguished into the intuitively apprehended pure notion time and the content the inherent implicit nature substance qua subject involves the necessity at first an inner necessity to set forth in itself what it inherently is to show itself to be spirit the completed systematic expression in objective form becomes then at the same time the reflection of substance the development of it into a self or subject consequently until and unless spirit is inherently completed completed as a world spirit it cannot reach its completion as self-conscious spirit the content of religion therefore expresses earlier in time than speculative science what spirit is but science alone is the perfect form in which spirit truly knows itself the process of carrying forward this form of knowledge of itself constitutes the task which spirit accomplishes in the concrete actual shape of history the religious communion in so far as it is at the outset the substance of absolute spirit is the crude form of consciousness which has an existence all the harsher and more barbaric the deeper is its inner spirit and its inarticulate stolid self has all the harder task in dealing with its essence the unconceived content alien to its consciousness not till it has surrendered the hope of cancelling that foreignness by an external that is alien method does it turn to itself to its own peculiar world in the actual present it turns thither because to supersede that alien method means returning into self-consciousness it thus discovers this world in the living present to be its own property 
and so has taken the first step to descend from the ideal intelligible world the world of the intellect or rather to endue the abstract element of the intellect with concrete selfhood through observation on the one hand it finds existence in the shape of thought and comprehends existence and conversely it finds in its thought existence when in the first instance it has thus itself expressed in an abstract way the immediate unity of thought and existence of abstract being and self and when it has expressed the primal principle of light in a purer form that is as the unity of extension and existence for existence is an ultimate simple term more akin to thought than light and in this way has revived again in thought the substance of the orient the absolute substance of eastern religions thereupon spirit at once recoils in horror from this abstract unity from this selfless substance and maintains as against it the principle of subjective individuality but after spirit has relinquished this principle and brought it under the ordeal of culture has thereby made it an objective existence and established it throughout the whole of existence has arrived at the idea of utility and in the sphere of absolute freedom has found the key to existence to be individual will after these stages spirit then brings to light the thought that lies in its inmost depths and expresses ultimate reality in the form ego equals ego this ego identical with ego is however an inward self-reflecting process for since this identity qua absolute negativity is absolute distinction the self-identity of the ego stands in contrast to this absolute distinction which being pure distinction and at the same time objective to the self that knows itself has to be expressed as time in this way just as formerly ultimate reality was expressed as unity of thought and extension it would here be interpreted as unity of thought and time but distinction left to itself unresting unhalting time really collapses upon itself it is the objective quiescence the stable continuity of extension while this latter is pure identity with self is ego again ego is not merely self it is identity of self with itself this identity however is complete and immediate unity with self in other words this subject is just as much substance substance by itself alone would be void and empty intuition anschauen or the intuition of a content which qua specific would have merely a contingent character and would be devoid of necessity substance would only stand for the absolute in so far as substance was thought of or intuited as absolute unity and all content would as regards its diversity have to fall outside the substance and be due to reflection a process which does not belong to substance because substance would not be subject would not be conceived as spirit as reflecting about self and reflecting itself into self if nevertheless a content were to be spoken of then on the one hand it would only exist in order to be thrown into the empty abysm of the absolute while on the other it would be picked up in external fashion from sense perception knowledge would appear to have come by things by what is distinct from knowledge itself and to have got at the distinctions between the endless variety of things without any one understanding how or where all this came from spirit however has shown itself to be neither the mere withdrawal of self-consciousness into its pure inwardness nor the mere absorption of self-consciousness into blank substance devoid of all distinctions spirit is the movement of the self which empties itself of self and sinks itself within its own substance and qua subject both goes out of that substance into self making its substance an object and a content and also supersedes this distinction of objectivity and content that first reflection out of immediacy is the subject's distinction of self from its substance the notion in a state of self diremption the subjectification of the self and the coming of the pure ego into being since this distinction is the action pure and simple of ego equals ego 
the notion is the necessity for and the uprising of existence which has the substance for its essential nature and subsists on its own account but this subsisting of existence for itself is the notion established and realized in determinate form and is thereby the notion's own inherent movement that of descending into the bare and simple substance which is only subject by being this negativity and going through this process ego has not to take its stand on the form of self-consciousness in opposition to the form of substantiality and objectivity as if it were afraid of emptying itself and becoming objective the power of spirit lies rather in remaining one with itself when giving up itself and because it is self-contained and self-subsistent in establishing as mere moments its explicit self-existence as well as its implicit inherent nature nor again is ego a tertium quid which casts distinctions back into the abysm of the absolute and declares them all to mean the same there on the contrary true knowledge lies rather in the seeming inactivity which merely watches and considers how the element distinguished proceeds how it is self-moved by its very nature and returns again into its own unity with absolute knowledge then spirit has wound up the process of its various forms and modes so far as in assuming these various shapes and forms it is affected with the insurmountable distinction which consciousness implies that is the distinction of consciousness from its object or content spirit has attained the pure element of its existence the notion the content is in view of the freedom of its own existence the self that empties and gives up itself to objectivity in other words that content is the immediate unity of self-knowledge the pure process of thus relinquishing itself to externality constitutes when we consider this process in its bearing on the content the necessity of this content the diversity of content is qua determinate and specific due to relation and is not inherent it is its restless activity of cancelling and superseding itself or its negativity thus the necessity or diversity like its free existence is the self too and in this self form in which existence is immediately thought the content is a notion seeing then that spirit has attained the notion it unfolds its existence and develops its processes in this ether of its life and is systematic science the moments of its process are set forth in science no longer as determinate modes or forms of consciousness but since the distinction which consciousness implies has reverted to and has become a distinction within the self as determinate notions and as the organic self-explaining and self-constituted process of these conceptions while in the phenomenology of mind each moment is the distinction of knowledge and truth and the process in which that distinction is cancelled and transcended on the other hand systematic science does not contain this distinction and supersession of distinction rather since each moment has the form of the notion it unites the objective form of truth and the knowing self in an immediate unity in science the individual moment does not appear as the process of passing back and forward from consciousness or presentation to self-consciousness and conversely there the pure form liberated from the condition of being an appearance in mere consciousness the pure notion with its further development depends solely and purely on its characteristic and specific nature conversely again there corresponds to every abstract moment of absolute science a form or mode in which mind as a whole makes its appearance as the mind that actually exists and historically appears is not richer than science so too mind in its actual content is not poorer to know the pure notions of science in the form in which they are modes or types of consciousness this constitutes the aspect of their reality in which its essential element the notion appearing there in its simple mediating activity as thinking breaks up and separates the moments of this mediation and exhibits its content by reference to the internal and immanent opposition of its elements science contains within itself this necessity of relinquishing and divesting itself of the form of the pure notion and necessarily involves the transition of the notion into consciousness 
for spirit that knows itself is just for the reason that it grasps its own notion immediate identity with itself and this in the distinction it implies is the certainty of what is immediate or is sense consciousness the beginning from which we started this process of releasing itself from the form of its self is the highest freedom and security of its knowledge of itself all the same this relinquishment of self and abandonment to externality are still incomplete this process expresses the relation of the certainty of its self to the object an object which just by being in relation has not yet attained its full freedom systematic knowledge is aware not only of itself but also of the negative of itself or its limit knowing its limit means knowing how to sacrifice itself this sacrifice is the emptying of self the self-abandonment in which spirit sets forth in the form of free and unconstrained fortuitous contingency its process of becoming spirit intuitively apprehending outside it its pure self as time and likewise its existence as space this last form into which spirit passes nature is its living immediate process of development nature spirit divested of self and given over to externality is in its actual existence nothing but this external process of abandoning its own independent subsistence and the movement which reinstates subject the other aspect however in which spirit comes into being history is process in terms of knowledge a conscious self-mediating process spirit given over to and emptied into time but this form of abandonment is similarly an emptying of itself by itself the negative is negative of itself this way of becoming presents a tardy procession and succession of spiritual shapes and forms a gallery of pictures each of which is endowed with the entire wealth of spirit and moves so tardily just for the reason that the self has to permeate and assimilate all this wealth of its substance since its accomplishment consists in spirit knowing what it is in fully comprehending its substance this knowledge means its subjectification a state in which spirit leaves its external existence behind and gives itself over to the attitude of recollection erinnerung. in this subjectification spirit is engulfed in the darkness and night of its own self-consciousness its vanished existence is however conserved therein and this superseded existence the previous state but born anew from the womb of knowledge is the new stage of existence a new world and a new type and mode of spirit here it has to begin all over again at its immediacy as freshly as before and thence rise once more to the measure of its stature as if for it all that proceeded were lost and as if it had learned nothing from the experience of the spirits that preceded but recollection erinnerung has conserved that experience and is the inner being and in fact the higher form of the substance while then this phase of spirit begins all over again its formative development apparently starting solely from itself yet at the same time it commences at a higher level the realm of spirit developed in this way and assuming definite shape in existence constitutes a succession where one detaches and sets loose the other and each takes over from its predecessor the empire of the spiritual world the goal of the process is the revelation of the depth of spiritual life and this is the absolute notion this revelation consequently means superseding its depth is its extension or spatial embodiment the negation of this subjectivity of the ego a negativity which is its self-relinquishment its externalization or its substance and this revelation is also its temporal embodiment in that this externalization in its very nature relinquishes externalizes itself and so exists at once in its spatial extension as well as in its death or the self the goal which is absolute knowledge or spirit knowing itself as spirit finds its pathway in the recollection of spiritual forms as they are in themselves and as they accomplish the organization of their spiritual kingdom 
their conservation looked at from the side of their free phenomenal existence in the sphere of contingency is history looked at from the side of their conceptually comprehended organization